Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... me, G. Marshall. What is your pleasure this time? How about a little murder with mystic overtones? Not to mention a most unusual motive. Why do men kill? In the ordinary way, for money, for power, for women. And then we have those who kill for revenge, or out of jealousy, or because they are consumed with hatred, or driven insane by emotion. Moving along, we even have those idealistic spirits who will kill you for your own good because you are too obstinate to accept their religion or their way of life, which they insist is better than yours. With all of these, we are more or less familiar. But did you ever hear of a man who was killed because the murderer wanted his talent? You're about to. Don't kill me! I, I'm sorry, Fred, I... I really don't want to. I, I I have money. Take my money. I don't want your money. I, I, I resign. You can have my job. You can have a great career. I said I was sorry. I'll give you everything I own. It's not enough. It's not enough. But I, I'm rich. It's not enough. Well, what do you want? I want everything you are. Everything you are. <laughs> Our mystery drama, A Death of Kings, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and imported Vigna Rosé wine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You're driving your car you knew you were going to buy the minute you saw it. Skyhawk, Buick Skyhawk. You just knew a car this streamlined would be easy on gas, and you were right. In published EPA mileage test results, Skyhawk got 25 miles per gallon on the open road and 16 in the city. Skyhawk. It's rakish, it's low slung, it looks European, but it's a Buick. Living free. Frederick Sparling, and you'd never notice him in the crowd. 
He's not much to look at. Middle-aged, stoop-shouldered, nearsighted. He spends his days in a science laboratory at one of our great state universities, teaching serious, younger versions of himself, men and women who in 20 years will become what he is now. Of the estimated 3 billion people who inhabit this planet, less than a thousand would possess even a glimmer of an understanding of what he's talking about. It's an almost metaphysical mixture of physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology. Well, that's how he spends his days, lecturing. However, he spends his nights listening to a lecture. And it's usually a variation on the same theme. Well, the suspense is over. Not that there ever was any. We knew all along Clontarf would be made head of the department. Well, Emma, after all... After uh, all what? The second time in 12 years you've been passed over. But that's you. Good old patient plotting Frederick Sparling. Nobody ever has to worry about fearful Freddy. He won't get mad. He won't quit. Go ahead. Use him. Abuse him. Now, my dear, I'm not aware that I've been used or abused... Indeed, in the department, everyone is the soul of courtesy. To promote Clontarf, who doesn't have half your seniority. Emma, dear, seniority isn't everything. Oh, no? No, of course not. Well, then, this must be something new. Let's see. In the early days, you said you were passed over because you had no seniority. And now that you have more than anybody else, suddenly seniority doesn't matter. Am I... It's complicated. No, it isn't. It's very simple. You know as well as I do that to be the department head, you have to be a full professor. Oh, let's not start rubbing salt in that wound. Yes, but am I? You the most to... brilliant man in the field, and you're only an associate professor. Emma, we go through this again and again, and really, you know why I'm not a full professor. Well, maybe he... you're satisfied being pushed around. Is. Sudden furious outbursts have been known to create such serious imbalance. Well, I'm right. You know I'm right. It's pure and plain and simple justice. Chemically, you risk death from oxygen deprivation. Oh, I'll die. And it's going to be the perfect crime. Because you'll kill me. But who could prove it? What's the district attorney going to say? Your Honor, he worried her to death. He got her so mad, she... There is a logical, reasonable explanation why I cannot be head of the department. Well, I don't want to hear it. I can't be head of the department unless I'm a full professor. And I won't be appointed full professor because... Well, I haven't published anything. And why not? Because... Why not? Look at the tripe those other men write. Precisely. And I won't publish unless it's something meaningful. Meaningful? Why, the work you're doing... I refuse to publish, to set forth certain... Why? Why? I'll tell you why. I've been conducting experiments that I... But I would never say this except in the privacy of my own home and to my own wife. I realize how this might sound to strangers... But I am now at a point where I have gone beyond the limits of present scientific knowledge. Well, aren't you going to say anything? What do you want me to say? I, I know how that must sound. As if... As if I'm insane. How can any man presume to say that he knows more than... If I... it's true, why shouldn't he say it? Is it true? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm afraid it's true. You're afraid? Why are you afraid? Because no man should know what I know. But you do know it. And that's why you should publish. No. No, never. I'm afraid that if I published what I know now, it... It could very well mean the end of the world. I don't care. 
What do you say? Oh, you scientist. You always talk like that. It's so ridiculous. The world goes on. Yes, but this... If is you're the... afraid you can destroy the world, don't let that stop you. What good is the world to me? Or to you, the way things are now? You're becoming the laughingstock of the college, and I'm becoming a dowdy old hag. And I'm not even 40. Oh, now, my dear. Now, please. my dear, what? You're the world's most brilliant scientist. Oh, well, I wouldn't say well, that. Well, I'd I... say it. You should have recognition. You should be internationally famous. Well, there are people who know about me. Well, what about I... me? I want some fun in my life. Some excitement. I want to stop squeezing dollars and hoarding pennies. I want to meet interesting and important people. I want you to start publishing. Is it possible that you don't understand? I told you, if I were to publish my findings, it could very well mean the end of the world. Who cares? As long as you get credit for it. What? What's this? Who'd call on us? I mean, it isn't as if we were somebody. Now, now, Emma, we are important. Everyone thinks highly of us. Are you kidding? Well, aren't you even curious? About what? About who's at the door. Oh, oh, yes, I know who's at the door. You do? It's Alex. Alex? Alexander Thornhill. I never heard of him. He's one of my students, one of my graduate students. Brilliant fellow, but he, uh... Yes? Well, he's having some financial difficulties, so I, I told him he could uh, stay here for a while. You what? Well, we do have a spare room. Well, you just tell him. He said he has no place to stay. <laughs> what am I running here? A hotel? He'll have to leave college. A brilliant mind will be lost to science. Well, science has too many brilliant minds now. You just tell him you made a mistake. Emma, you can't... Go ahead, make me the villain. Just tell him that your wife disapproves. But, Emma, this young man must have a play. You won't tell him. All right, I'll tell him. I'm coming. Wear out the bell. Look here. I'm Mrs. Sparling, and I want to tell you that it's... Good evening. I'm so happy to meet you. It's... A pleasure. I, I thought Dr. Sparling had told me all about you, but I see now he's... He's really told me nothing. Is that Alex Thornhill, Emma? Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's Alex, Professor. <laughs> well, won't you come in? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Emma? Mr. Alex Thornhill. Alex? My wife? How do you do? Have you, uh, had your supper? Frankly, No. Emma, we should have quite a bit of the roast left. Why don't you fix a bite for Alex while I see to the spare room? Well, Alex, I, I thought you were bringing all of your things. I did. Everything I own in the world. In that little sack? Well, let me get your room ready, and meanwhile, you two can get acquainted. Excuse me? He, uh... He didn't ask you, did he? <laughs> What do you mean? Oh, well, I, I can tell you're not overjoyed to have me stay here. Well, why do you say that? Are you sure I won't be in the way? Why Why would you be in the way? Oh, I... I don't know. I had the feeling... No, actually, we have a big house here. And we should share it with... Uh, well, you must be hungry. I'm starved. I'm sorry, because I don't think you'll enjoy dinner. Oh, why not? Well, the professor has all kinds of quirky diet things. He has a peculiar nervous system. He can't have salt or spices or anything that's good. So oh. we have a pretty tasteless cuisine around here. And besides, I, uh, I'm a terrible cook. I admire women who can't cook. You do? Sure. Shows they've been putting their time to better use. I have the feeling... That I've been standing in a peat bog for the past 15 years. Oh, why did I say that? Probably because it's true. Well, of course it's true, but that's no reason to blurt it out to... to a perfect stranger. Am I really a stranger? 
I don't know what's the matter with me. I met you just a couple of minutes ago, and here I am just about ready to tell you the story of my life. Oh, I... I'd love to hear it. Well, you probably know it. Fading, aging wife of an obscure professor. <laughs> oh, forget it. Uh, do you take coffee or tea? May I call you Emma? If you can stand it. Emma happens to be my favorite name. How could Emma be anybody's favorite name? It has such a school teacher, maiden aunt sort of ring to it. Oh, no, no. Emma was the name of my favorite English queen. Emma? Yes, forget Elizabeth and Victoria. Emma was the most spectacular of them all. Oh, what a woman. Wife to two kings, mother of two kings, seductive, brilliant, wanton. Emma, the last great Saxon queen of England. And you remind me of Emma. <laughs> you speak as if she were a friend of yours. There are times when I actually feel close to her. Now, for instance... Do you suppose that you could be the reincarnation of Emma? Oh, that's impossible. Why? Every one of us is the reincarnation of someone else. Well, that's ridiculous. You can't be serious. I'm always serious. Well, don't let Fred hear you talk like that. Why not? What do you think the good Professor Sparling is really talking about in his advanced seminar? Reincarnation. You can't be serious. Fred... A believer in reincarnation? Oh, he wouldn't call it that. He hides it behind formulae and equations, but it's, it's, it's a form of reincarnation. Oh, I don't believe it. And his is purposeful reincarnation instead of the hit-and-miss haphazard thing that exists in nature. And I... I could be the reincarnation of Queen Emma? Oh, yes. <laughs> How would you know? Come here. No, don't. Why? Because. Yes, because. Because he might come downstairs any minute. Really? Listen, I, I, I love my husband. Oh, do you? And besides, I hardly even know you. You know me. You knew me. Think. Think back. No, I, 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 I don't believe a word of what you're saying. I need you, Emma. I always needed you. What are you, you talking about? I wasted you last time. I didn't realize what you could do for me. You must be crazy. Are you listening to what you're saying? That was a thousand years ago. I was ignorant. I was arrogant. I wanted to own the world, but I didn't know how. Then what do you want with me? You're hardly more than a boy. I'm older than I look. Oh, please. And you're not as old as you look. Thank you. But I have a secret magic formula that can make you look younger. Years younger. And what's that? Just come here. But I... You don't have to talk. Alex. Oh. Now, look at yourself. Look in the mirror. Look at your eyes, your face. If Fred finds out, it'll kill him. I know, my darling, but it's necessary for him to die in any event. Die? Fred has to die... Why? Why does he have to die? Because we shall be compelled to kill him. We have to kill Fred? Yes, my dearest Emma, but uh, be still. Oh, <laughs> I see you two are getting along famously. Well, your room is ready for you, Alex. Thank you. You know, Emma, darling, I was sure you'd approve of Alex. I was convinced you'd like him. The amenities, the niceties, the small talk that makes up so much of the ritual of our lives. I was sure you'd approve of him. I was convinced you'd like Alex. If the good professor only knew how much Emma approved of and liked Alex, he may find out when I come back shortly with Act Two. I want that sinus medicine. Headache tablets? No, sinus medicine. Sinus tablets. Helps the headache and the pressure. Oh, you mean sign off. Exactly. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take sign off tablets. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. -F, the sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin plus a sinus drainer. Sign off. The sinus medicine that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. And Sinoff doesn't stop there. 
Have you tried Sign Off Sinus Spray, the fastest known form of sinus congestion relief? It works in seconds. That Sign Off Sinus Spray. When sinus flares up, use Sign Off Tablets and Spray, only as directed. S I N E O F F. Sign Off. Exactly. Sign Off, the sinus medicines in the bright red box. Hello, I'm Helen Hayes. There's something very important happening in this country. High school students from 60 nations are living here for a year in the United States. They're learning about us, about our families, our schools, our communities. And we're learning from them. It happens through American Field Service, AFS, and the thousands of people who give their time to help others. Volunteers help find families to host students. They arrange activities in the community and help raise scholarship funds. AFS is an exciting and rewarding activity that deserves a place in your town or your city. To find out how you can help bring an international experience to your school and community, write AFS 313 East 43rd Street, New York, New York. That's AFS. 313 East 43rd Street, New York, New York. I suppose it's the story of the world. True genius is often overlooked and must labor in obscurity while sham and fraud receive the rewards of the genuine article. However, as they say, virtue is its own reward, and it's usually enough for the truly virtuous. For Professor Frederick Sparling, enough is as good as a feast. He has his work, he has his wife, he has his home, and he even has his disciple. Can the true man of learning ask for more? Seize him! Seize him! No! No! No, pity me! Pity me, my lady! Pity? What has pity to do with the line of succession? Please, my lady! Please! Out! Sword! Kill him! No! No! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Uh, uh, Emma, Kill. my dear, wake Kill. up. Kill. What? Oh. what do you want? Wake up. What? what? What do you want? What's the matter? You, you were having a nightmare. I was. Oh, oh yes, I must have. Oh, it was so real. I know. You know. Until you became disturbed, it was... Oh, it must have been a splendid dream. I could hear what you were saying. What? What was I saying? Well, you seem to be a famous namesake of yours. Emma of Normandy, who married first King Ethelred and then King Canute. Yes. Yes, that was the dream. Well, now, what could possibly cause you to have such a dream? Fred... How long is Alex going to stay with us? Well, I don't know. Why? Because I don't think it's a good idea. Well, I thought you liked Alex. I do. A young person about the house seems to make things more cheerful. A young person? It isn't as if we were ready for our social security. <laughs> well, we're matured, settled. Fred, how long do you want him to stay? He practically pays his way. He makes himself useful about the house. He fixes things. Fred, please. I would rather that he left us. Why? What objection can you make against him? Alex, I don't think coming to a place like this is such a good idea. Why not? Well, really, we shouldn't be seen together. Huh. Who's going to see us? When is the last time you went out dancing? I don't remember. When is the last time you had any fun? I can't remember. Alex, I want to tell you something. Do you want me to leave the house? How do you...
did you know? Because you're being Emma. Queen Emma. Oh, please, Ellie. Don't you see how your life runs parallel? She was also married to a Fred Sparling, except his name was Ethelred. Ethelred the Unlead. Oh, that's nonsense. Why? Well, how can it be anything else? His world fell apart, but not hers. She knew what to do. She prepared for the future. And so, when her husband died, providentially, they say she may have had a hand in it. Why are we talking about this? Is it painful? People don't die. Oh, now I know you're crazy. The outer shell, the hull, the husk, that wears out. But what's inside can never be destroyed. Please, please take me home. The genius of a Da Vinci, a Beethoven, the, the evil of a, of a de' Medici. What happens to it? It goes on living. It finds itself another shell, another husk, another covering, another uh, temporary shelter. I mean, you can't prove that. Do I have to? Doesn't it make sense? You could have been Emma. Emma of Normandy. I am not the kind of woman who leaves her husband. Even if you're unhappy? I'm more than just unhappy. I'm frustrated and I'm bitter and I... Oh, what's the difference? I made a vow. So did Emma of Normandy. If I hear one more word about Emma of Normandy, I'll walk out of this place. All I'm asking is... Just look, look around you. Look at all these really attractive girls. Some of them are half my age. Look at how they're looking at you so boldly and invitingly. Why do you want me? Oh, I know your problem. You're afraid this is just a lark for me. And when it's over, I'll walk out on you. Well, won't you? No, I couldn't. Because after Fred is gone, I'll need you more than ever. Why do you keep saying, after he's gone? Because he has to go. I demand the surrender of the castle and the abdication of the throne. Well, give him your answer. Hurl down heavy boulders. Pour boiling pitch from the battlement. Emma, be silent. I will not be silent. While this bloodthirsty Viking pirate. Emma, that's what he is. That's all he is. He will not take away my kingdom. You forget. I am the king. Then act like a king. Ethel, what am I to do? I... You? Mount your horse. Lead your troops through the gate in counterattack. Be the king. Attack. I, uh, I... Yes. What? I shall have to consult with my counselors. And meanwhile, we shall lose the kingdom. No, no. We shall consult and discuss and hold a parley. What is your answer, Saxon King? Let your sword answer him. Let your sword find his heart's blood. Emma, I must listen to my counselors. Your counselors. Ignorant, half-witted, traitorous. Now, Emma, really, you have said too much. What is your answer? We shall storm the gate. We answer death. <laughs> But, my dear Emma, one simply does not make a sharp 180-degree turn and just change the direction of one's life. Well, one does, if one's life depends on it. Emma, my dear, I think you put some salt into the soup. Oh, Fred, we have to break out of here. This house. But this house is our home. It's our castle. Don't say castle. But we simply cannot... Pick up and leave? Why not? Well, for one thing, I would have to consult with some people. Consult? Why? Whose business is it but ours? And I want you to stop teaching. Stop teaching? How could I do that? It's very simple. Just resign. I'll type the letter for you. What would I do to earn a living? You could write. About what? About the things you know. Things no one else does. Those, uh... Dangerous thing. Good. Then the whole world will want to read them. What I know, in the hands of an unscrupulous man, could... Well, he could own the world. How? Oh. He could simply say, obey me, or you will cease to exist. Then why don't you say it? Because I... 
I can't. Why can't you? Because... Oh, I... I can't even explain it. Try. No, don't you see? A man isn't just what he knows. What he knows is a part, a dynamic part of everything that combines to make his personality. This knowledge is only a part of me. There's the rest of me. And what I am prevents me from being ruthless. Well, I can do it for you, Fred. Oh, Fred, aren't you sick of being nobody? Well, I don't feel that I'm Well, nobody. you're a character at the college. Oh, sure, there's old Fred Sparling. Old? You're hardly 45. Harmless old Fred. He teaches our seminars way up in the clouds there. All that theoretical stuff has no practical application. Now, 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 Emma, you're beginning to secrete adrenaline. I know that, Fred. Too much. What do you expect? You have to secrete enough for two. Yours never flows. Your heartbeat, your pulse, your respiration. Oh, damn it, Fred. Those are the vital signs of life. Don't you ever get mad. No. Well, I see no point to anger. Well, maybe this will make you mad. Your star pupil, Alex. Ah, brilliant lad. He's more than my star pupil. He's my disciple. So much the worse. Alex, his life depends on your generosity. Without you, his education would be finished. Now, please, Emma, one doesn't flaunt charity. Without you, he wouldn't have a place to sleep. We are commanded by a higher power than ourselves to share what we have. It's our duty to share. Is it? Of course. Everything? Yes, Emma. We must share everything we have. Even our wives? What? What did you say? I want to know if a man is required to share his wife. Darling, what does this have to do with Everything. Alex? From the charitable goodness of your heart, you have given Alex a place to sleep. And from the moment he crossed your threshold, he has been trying to sleep with me. Now, Fred, what do you say to that? There are an infinite number of replies a man can make when his wife says what we just heard Emma say. I'll kill him. Or he could say, I'll congratulate him. He could say, well, that's gratitude. Or he could say, you must admit, my friend has excellent taste. Who knows? We all will when I return shortly with Act Three. <laughs> Belair's here with an interesting fact about water, brought to you by your local Culligan man. Did you know that in the United States, there's almost 20 times as much water in the ground as there is water on the surface? For example, Florida alone has more underground water than all the water in the Great Lakes combined. And uh, speaking of the Great Lakes, there's a popular misconception that Lake Michigan water is soft. However, According to a government study, to be classified as soft, water must contain less than three and a half grains of hardness per gallon. And Lake Michigan water contains about eight grains of hardness per gallon. So, call your local Culligan man. Ask him to show you the difference that hardness makes. Whether you have Lake Michigan water or other than Lake Michigan water, 
you'll be astounded. There's no cost or obligation, so call your Culligan man today. You'll find him underwater in the yellow pages. WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Correct time is 1108. While certain primitive tribes consider women as communal property, and the greatest honor you can show a man is to accept his wife, this custom is not true of our own society. Or at least, uh, we don't think so. Therefore, when Emma suggested to Fred that Alex was attempting to create what the French, who always have a charming name for these things, call a menage à trois, Fred's first reaction was, Emma, my dear, I was aware of it. You were? You knew? Well, I'm a scientist. And what, after all, is science with observation? Observation and deduction. And you can just sit there and eat your soup. Well, why not? It's delicious soup. Alex is trying to get me to... To betray you. <laughs> That's a charming, old-fashioned term. Oh, I can't believe we're having this conversation. Why? Because you're incredible. Would you feel better if I commanded Alex to leave the house? Well, you should do something. No. You should do something. Me? You should either discourage him or... Or what? Well, my dear, you lead him on. That's a lie. If you want him, does it matter where you have him? Here or somewhere else? I want to do something about us. You keep telling me you can be the most powerful man in the world. Well, then how can I be satisfied just to be a dowdy, do-nothing, stay-at-home drudge? Emma, let me tell you that scientists labor in the darkness. Now and then, fate, providence, a higher power, gives us a sudden searing flash of insight. For a brief, awful moment, the curtain is drawn and the brilliant light of knowledge is burned into the soul. Perhaps it was a joke. A joke? A celestial joke to make that revelation to me. Perhaps it was known that I, that I wouldn't, I couldn't use it. You look beautiful tonight. Keep saying it. You'll convince me. You know what a woman needs to make her beautiful? She has to be secure in the knowledge that a man loves her. I always knew that Fred loved me. He doesn't count. I said a man. I know what you're saying. And I know what you mean. And I believe you. You sure it isn't the wine talking? It's me talking. Emma Sparling, formerly Emma of Normandy. Ah, do you really believe you were Emma of Normandy? You were the one who convinced me of it originally. But does it matter if it's true or not? I feel like Emma of Normandy. Then you know what we have to do with Fred. Leave him. Break out of here. That's right. We can go anywhere in the world. Anywhere you say. Wonderful. Now, could I ask a question? Money. What do we do for money? Like the pirates of old, we will demand tribute. Pay or be destroyed. And how can that be arranged? Fred can do that for us. Fred? That part of Fred that knows how to do it. Listen, Fred told me... I know what Fred told you. I know Fred's problem. His moral, his ethical, his personal problem. He refuses to use the knowledge that would give him one favor. I seek, but I can. How? How will you get it? Is it in a formula or something like that? Oh, no. No, it's nothing like that. It exists in his consciousness. I don't follow. It's his talent, Emma. His personality. I mean, to take those from him. I'm not hearing you right. Why? 
We can transplant a heart from one body to another, a kidney, other organs. Why not a talent transplant? A talent is... Is what? It's a quality. People have it. It exists. It can be removed. How do you know? Fred told me. Fred showed me. He showed you? Yes, in the lab. On animals. Oh, I don't believe it. Listen. We have made vicious dogs out of calm dogs, smart dogs out of stupid dogs, and the other way around. But that's unbelievable. The mentality, the personality. He knows how to isolate those forces and transplant them. How? How? By surgery? How could you ever perform an operation? It's psychic surgery. I don't believe it. What will happen to Fred after you... He'll be dead. But that's murder. That's freedom. Freedom for you and me. He's a fool. He has unbelievable powers. This psychic surgery is the least of them. He could rule the world. He has scruples. I have no scruples. Now, what do you say? I... I say... When... More coffee, darling. Oh, yes, yes, I think so. I, uh, I don't understand why I should feel so drowsy. I, maybe, maybe it'll wake me up. Here you are, Fred. I have some papers I really should go over this evening. Uh, Alex. Yes, Professor? We really should check the results of those experiments. I... If you're feeling up to it. No, I, I'll, I'll be perfectly all right as soon as I finish this coffee and, uh, and... He's out. Yes, but a bit too deeply. You put too much of that, I... What should we do? It's all right. He'll come around. We only need him to be semi-conscious. How, how are you going to... Hand me those needles. Uh, no, 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 no. One at a time. Mm. All right. Now, cut away his sleeve. Yes. Yeah. Good. All right, careful, careful. Good, good. Now, swab his arm with the alcohol. And let me just plunge home the... There. Alex, I'm frightened. No, please, it's too late now. Hand me the needle on the other end of that wire. Is it, uh... Is it like a, a, a blood transfusion? No, no, no. How can it be a blood transfusion? It's not a tube. It's a wire. Here, swab my arm with alcohol. Yes. And hand me the needle. Be careful. I know how to do this. Since you told me that Fred will be dead afterwards. Won't the police... Don't worry. The doctor will see only natural causes. Heart failure, shock, no way to prove murder. Now, get that little box that I hid on the shelf. Quickly. Emma. Oh. Emma. He's coming, too. Don't worry about uh, it. When this is over, I'll be unconscious. Uh, do you remember what you have to do? Emma. Uh, he's, he's waking up. No, no, no. He's just coming around to where I want him. What do you have to do afterward? I have to remove the needles and take the box, everything we used, and hide them in the attic. Yes. Yes, then I call the doctor... Because uh, both of you will be unconscious. You will tell the doctor that we collapsed. Yes, that's right. And that's all you'll do until I become conscious again. Yes. Now, how long will that take? Ah, uh, a day, two days. Uh, uh, Alex. Oh. Alex. What, what are you doing? I think you know, Fred. No. No, don't. No, Alex. Turn up the volume, Emma. What? The middle knob on the box. The middle knob. That one. Yes. Turn it up. Emma. Go, turn it. It, it is, won't do you any good, Alex. Don't kill me. I am a... Alex, maybe... It's too late, too late. You, you have done it for nothing. For nothing. Higher, Emma, higher. Alex, I'm frightened. Oh, for nothing. You're killing me for nothing. It's working. Already I feel something. I see something. I know something. Oh, good Lord. What I see. What I know. Nothing. It's for nothing. You knew this. And you didn't use it. I'll ruin the world. No. No. Alec. Is he dead? 
Emma, we own the world. I can make matter disintegrate before your eyes. I can make it happen just by thinking. No one can stop me. We will rule, Emma, the way we once did. But this time, forever! Alex, Alex, darling. Uh, 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 You're uh, coming out of it. uh, Alex, Alex, speak to me. Oh, Emma. (laughs) Emma. (laughs) Your voice. It's so different, yet so familiar. Well, is is everything uh, all right? Oh, yes, darling, yes. The doctor came after... After you fell unconscious? Yes. Yes, and I did everything you told me. I hid the apparatus, and I said that you two had just collapsed at the table. And the doctor and the police had a fine time with all that. Uh, Emma. But it's over now. And no one suspects. We did it, my darling. We did it. And now, let's live. Uh, Emma. Here, I brought you a cup of coffee. Mm, Come on, drink it. You'll feel better. And then I'll prepare you some dinner. Thank you, dear. Thank you. I, uh, oh. What is it? Oh, sugar. You you put sugar in this. <laughs> you know I can't tolerate sugar. Alex. I mean, how many years have you cooked for me, dear? No sugar, no spices. I, I have a very delicate metabolism. Alex, what are you saying? Oh, I, I must get up. I must uh, get to the laboratory. No. No, we're leaving. We're going to be rich. (laughs) What are you saying, my dear? Whatever gave you such... You! You're not Alex. Well, of course I'm Alex. But you're talking like Fred. Well, I I must talk like Fred and then think like Fred and act like Fred. But you said if you transplanted his talent... Well, yes, yes, I have his talent, but I also have... His personality. You see, I am Fred. Oh, no. No. We'll we'll be happy here, Emma. Very happy with our work, our home. What more could we ask, Emma? You call yourself a king. A king. What are you saying? You are a fool and a coward. Emma. I never want to see you again. I'm going to him. Let go of me. No, Emma, no. I must take you to a doctor. I want the pirates. The Viking pirates. We could rule the world. Yes, dear, I understand. Now, I'll take you to the doctor and you'll feel better. Help me find my Viking pirates. Yes, dear. (sighs) Of course I'll help you. She started out a thousand years ago as Emma of Normandy. That was the first time she married Ethelred the Unready and left him for the Viking Canute. And she's been leaving him ever since. But this time, for the first time, she has both of them in the same body. Where can she go from here? We'll have to wait a couple of hundred years to find out. You only have to wait a few moments, however, for me to return with more. You're on the open road, rolling free and feeling great about your new Buick Century. Because in published EPA mileage test results, a V6 Buick Century got the best highway mileage of any U.S. mid-sized car. 24 miles per gallon and 16 in the city. The Century's comfortable, it's nimble, it's economical, and above all... It's a Buick. Living free. And now for a look at today's top stories. Cost of living still soaring with no end in sight. The price of hamburger at the supermarket... Oh, it's so depressing. The dollar just doesn't go as far as it used to go. Cheer up. Your dollar still goes a long way in fighting birth defects. I turned that radio off. But the message still comes through. Help support March of Dimes' research into the cause and treatment of birth defects. Okay, great. I'll join the March of Dimes today and find a way of life.
A poet says, Inside us all faintly echo the softest notes of a forgotten melody. Where did we once hear it? And when did we sing it? Sometimes in the absolute loneliness of the darkest night, there is a whisper. Is it a vagrant breeze? Or someone calling out, reaching out from the bottomless well of the past and saying, remember me? Once I was you. But perhaps things are best left the way they are. Perhaps there are things best not remembered. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, William Redfield, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I'm sorry, son, I didn't understand. Those were the six words. Sorry for what? For remembering me. I wouldn't expect her to forget immediately, of course. That would be unreasonable. But as soon as possible, put me out of her mind. My life on Earth was over. Well, I'm sure she meant well, your mother. After you're here a while, you'll realize that everybody doesn't mean well. And quite often does a lot of harm. But your mother loved you. Then why not leave me alone to enjoy myself? Why wake up in the middle of the night to remember how handsome I looked the day I graduated from dental college? So inconsiderate. Why was it inconsiderate? Because, my dear fellow, if she kept it up long enough, I'd have to stop whatever I was doing and go visit her. Visit her? How could you do that? How? As a ghost, of course. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant... Dreams? Hey, weirdos. Our next Weirdo Watch Party is this Saturday, August 17th, with weirdo family favorite Mistress Malicious and her crew from Mistress Peace Theater. This time, Mistress is bringing us a film from 2015 entitled Killer Piñata. A possessed piñata seeking to avenge the savagery that humanity has inflicted on his kind picks off a group of friends one by one in an unending night of terror. I'm gonna take a wild guess and say this is more comedy and less creeps, but we'll find out. The fun begins this Saturday night. August 17th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch. Just tune in at showtime and watch the movie with me and other Weirdo family members, and even join in the chat during the film for more fun. It's Mistress Malicious presenting Killer Piñata this Saturday night, 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV. See you Saturday! Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in Box 13? Box 
Folks, 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now, let's see. Where was I? Oh, but Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. It has the odor of Christmas night. Or, uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything, what I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridal path. Signed, Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. Well, take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. An anonymous note. A rendezvous in the park at night. Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was riding. At least it's got a good start. The question is, what's the ending? Well, this is the park, and the clock says ten. There's the bench at the end of the bridle path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep, nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Oh, I'm sorry. The gentleman came when I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. Well, aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? Yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. Oh, I like you a lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. Just happened, I guess. What's your name? Jamie. I mean, uh, what's your other name? I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Janie? Oh, I've got two homes and... I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I liked you and I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie... Flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then if we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right and go two blocks. <sighs> That's home. That's where the ice cream fire is. Now, stop that, Janie, and tell me how to get to your home. 
Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Honey, they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At 10 o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Here, let me see uh-huh. that. Well, how do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother. Hmm. You're nice. I like your voice. What's your name? Dan. A sucker, if there ever was one. This is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Then, Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. Uh, Put it down on the couch, Holiday. Hmm, That's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, Feels kind of good, too. Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holiday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? Well, she's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I'm in a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holliday, keep her just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You'll just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. You'll understand soon, Mr. Holliday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're right, our Holliday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. <laughs> Janie. Oh, that's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't mean to. I wanted my fairy tale book. No, don't cry, honey. That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. Are you a night man? Are you my daddy? No, Janie. My daddy went away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? Hmm. It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleepy? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now, you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? No, I'm sorry. No doll. Teddy bear? No teddy bear. You must be awful lonesome. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears. The papa bear, the mama bear, and and the... And the baby bear. I know that story. Hmm. 
Okay, uh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Red Riding Hood. And, and the... the wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed. And it grew up into a mighty tall vine. And, and he, he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. Whew. Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. Oh, that's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. When you stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. <laughs> well, what's this? A little girl. Oh, thanks, Holiday. Uh, what's your name, young lady? Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it doesn't. It isn't? Uh, Holiday. Great little kidder. Dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody uh, else. Uh, all children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop. A policeman, honey. Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. Is the writing business slow these days, Holiday? How do you mean? Oh, I thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh, oh yes, just helping out a friend. I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? That depends. Uh, are your children anything like you? No, Holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad to accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, Holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Whew. Your hand is shaking. Never mind, Janie. It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Hmm. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off, you'll wake the kid. You Dan Holiday? Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old. Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Can you use the phone down the hall? I'm sorry about this. But get inside then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Oh, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. He comes with me, Holiday. Let's keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holiday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? Mr. Holliday, I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holliday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? 
A man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man, did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. Oh, it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? Harley, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, yeah, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. I mustn't see him. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can't a man get some sleep? With your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant, mind telling me what this is all about? Uh, I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant. I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Kling, you have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you could remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I dropped here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. Lieutenant, you'd never believe me. Then where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. <laughs> At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holiday. You. They're gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's Mr. mother... Mr. Holiday, there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark... What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here, but I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. But Mr. Holliday... He carries the gun. You stay here. You'll get her. You'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. I'll be waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight, and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. There. There it is. Brown's Motel. This is one time you'd better be right, Holiday. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. 
Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He, he said he didn't want to be disturbed. This is a matter of life and death. Get into the phone. Uh, who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Now, Clark Holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just step around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? Hello? Hello! What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark! Oh! That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is? Of course I do, Daddy. Now tell me quickly. That man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Well, come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. Mommy! I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holliday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Janie. Mommy! Janie. No, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mommies. Holliday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holliday. Thanks. Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Kling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Kling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. If neither of these two ladies had the child... Who did? A man named Sam Parker, who turned out to be Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her... A child, a holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no, not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer that door, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? No. Oh. Hey, that's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up his gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. Mr. Holliday, how can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holliday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Mommy. Yes? He fixed it so I can keep my two mommy, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. And would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holliday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Janie, and this is my daddy. 
Why, Mr. Holliday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh boy, I'll bet this is going to be good. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. M&J Audio Theater presents Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. and have yourself a seat. <laughs> Rest your weary bones. Yes. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Chet Chetta, the morgue attendant. I'm also a licensed embalmer and the resident storyteller. Now, let's see what I have for you today. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yes, my story for today begins in Biloxi, at a new restaurant owned by a retired seaman named Buford Van Horn. Buford's Bar and Seafood Place, it was called. I have a cherry pie special there, Buford. You're already? One cherry pie special coming up. Will you be having any coffee with that, Mr. Fair? Yeah, yeah, give me a coffee with about six sugars. Oh, a sugar coffee, I got you. Uh, I'm finished with this paper, Caesar, if you want it. Uh, be sure to check out the headline, it's a doozy. Thank you, Doc Stone. Let's see here. Oh, no, it happened. Look at this, Buford. Yeah. Elmer Corn made the front page. Oh, well, that's not a surprise. He's the talk of the town. Saved from gator attack. Tuesday afternoon, a truck transporting 12 Louisiana gators to Marshall County overturned on Highway 171. 
the alligators escaped into the streets of Biloxi and caused a panic among the citizens. A local resident, Elmer Corn, risked his life to capture the 12-foot-long gators. It was a good example of mind over manpower, said Mr. Corn, of the ordeal. Dad, come it. Hey. Buford, I helped Elmer with that. I should get some credit, too. Well, now, uh, maybe you can be one of them there uh, unsung heroes. Yeah. Hey, here's your pie, Mr. Ferris. You know, the sun will still set and rise hey. without that Elmer Corn. Thank you, Buford. Uh, hey, mister, my daddy says that you know Elmer Corn. Is that right? Yeah, I know Elmer Corn, and what's it to you, little girl? He's my hero. I want to get his autograph. You don't want Elmer Corn's autograph. Heck, he's just a manure hauler. That's all he is. But he wrestled all those alligators. Not even my daddy could do that. Yeah, well, he didn't exactly wrestle him. Hey, it looks like old uh, Mr. Corn is quite a popular fan. I think I'll need my cherry pie, actually. Sure, you just do that, Buford. How about this? Let's erect a gold statue in his honor hey. and then rename the town Elmer City. How about that? I never thought of that. Hey. Hey, little girl, come yeah. over here. Yeah, sir. I bet Elmer Corn can't dislocate his shoulders gonna, like I can. What are you gonna Watch do? this. Oh. Oh. I've never seen anything like that before, oh. Mr. Perry. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh. Isn't that neat? Oh. You don't like it? It'll just come back into place. I just... How's that, Mr. Van Trouten? See something? Well, if it isn't the man of the hour. Hey, everyone, Mr. Corn's here. Oh, now, now. Now, come on. Yeah, fuck. Now, now, all right, let's settle down now. I told him not to make such a fuss and print that, that story in the paper. Yeah, I'm sure, hey, Elmer. Um, Cecil, what yeah. in the world happened to your shoulder? I dislocated my shoulders on purpose. Shoot Look fall. at this. I... If I try hard enough, I can touch them both together. Oh, no, 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 don't do that, Cecil. Dad gum. They're liable to get stuck that way. That ain't nothing to brag about. Hey, Elmer, I've got a grizzly bear for you to wrestle. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Okay, you fellas stop pulling my dad gum leg. Now, y'all know how the Biloxi Gazette blows everything out of free portion. Now, I didn't wrestle no dad gum gator. I, I got the whole idea from a cartoon. I just rubbed them on the belly. They get just as docile, they go right to sleep. Well, heck, Cecil helped me load them back into the truck. I sure did. Heck, I was holding the most dangerous part, the jaws. I could have got my arms bit off. Ain't nothing worse than a fella who brags. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, Cecil deserves the credit. I mean, even a drowsy gator can be dangerous. So, Cecil, we still on for tonight? You gonna come over and watch wrestling matches with me? The Mala Warrior's gonna unleash a new hold, the Persian Spine Snapper. Well, I don't know, Elmer. I just might not be able to make it tonight. How about that? Well, uh, suit yourself. That just means more chili dogs for me. Oh. Gracious sakes alive. What a noise. Elmer. Yeah, it shook the whole place. What in the world was that? Elmer, I saw it through the window. It came from the sky. It landed in Miss Pluckett's backyard. Look at the size of that thing, Mr. Buford. Whatever it is, it's landed in old Winter Pluckett's yard. Lord, that old woman's gonna have a conniption feast. Yeah, yeah, it's a big metal thingamajig. Yeah. But the size of my trailer one. Yeah, it's drawn little crowd of onlookers, I see. Ah, yeah. uh, you can bet your price there. This is gonna be in the front page of the Gazette tomorrow. Oh, yeah, this is exciting news. Almost as exciting as you wrestling them alligators. Oh, well, you get on out of here. Well, let's go golf with the rest of them. What do you say? Uh, Are you going to do your duty and I've, get these people off in my yard, or do I have to go get my swell gun? Now, you just simmer right down, Miss Miss Pluckett. If there's going to be any shooting done around here, I'm going to do it myself. Hot dog, will you have to use our pistol, Sheriff? Uh, let's, uh, let's don't go for our guns quite yet. What oh. do you say, Roland? Okay. So, why don't you go up and tell that crowd to back away from that thing? We don't know what we're dealing with yet. Uh, yes, sir, Sheriff. I'll go over there and holler at him right now. Uh, uh, all right. Oh, okay, everybody. Everybody back off now. Back off. It's police business. Don't make me use the tear gas and the rubber bullets. Okay. You, uh, you got any idea what that thing is, Sheriff? Well, I don't know, Elmer. It's a big metal thorn in my side is what it is. Big hunk of space junk, probably. Just had to fall during lunch hour. I'll bet you it's a meteorite. 
I'm going to go poke it with a stick. Now, you ain't going to get near that thing, Ernie. You see, you, you can hear that humming noise coming from it. That doohickey still got some power in it. You stay away from that thing. Well, uh, here comes Cecil Ferris in his motorcycle. He might have some ideas of what it is. On, yeah, sure. Ask Cecil. On, That'll be dance. good for a laugh. Hey. Hey, Cecil. Yeah. Over here. Yeah, Elmer. Sorry it took me so long with my signal cap breaking down. <laughs> Cecil, that pile of junk ain't worth the air in its tires. Why don't you just scrap that eyesore? You watch what you say about my sickle, Bert. That thing can't defend itself. Now, now, let's not scuffle, boys. Let's not scuffle. Uh, we were studying on what this thing is, Cecil. Yeah. You got any guesses? Well, I guess it could be a UFO. <laughs> Ain't that just like a hick? If it falls from space, it's got to be a UFO. Yeah, Cecil, you reckon there's some face-melting aliens in there? Man, now, it, why won't anybody <laughs> listen to me? Now, y'all get off Cecil's back. I ain't seen near one of y'all come up with an idea that's better than he has. Oh, okay. UFO sounds just about as good as any. Yeah, right. Yeah. And when it comes to being a hick, Ernie, you got that down to an art form. Now, wait a second. But now, I, I, I think, boys, I, I think I got this narrowed down. Whatever that thing is, it comes from this planet. Hey, see. Look on there on the side. Look at there. Right. Yeah. It's some um, writing, and it's English, too. Oh, it sure is. Look at there. Property of Innovatrix, a private firm. Patent pending. Hey. If this satellite falls to Earth, please call 1-800-BIG-BANG. Big Bang. That don't sound good. I want that big old thing to open my property. You understand, Sheriff? Oh, uh, yes, Miss Pluckett, yes. Sir. It looks like it only weighs about 20 tons, so I'll tell you what, I'll just, I'll hook it up to the squad car and I'll drag it out in the ditch for you, all right? Sure. I, I think me and the boys got it figured out. I think it's a satellite. It's got a number on the side of it. 1-800-BIG-BANG. Big Bang, Big Bang. I got to write that down on my hand. On a small, secluded, tropical island. Here is your martini, Mr. Durden's room. Oh, bless you, child. Hmm. Basking in this hot sun works up a thirst. <laughs> Beer, dear love, find someone to shimmy up that tree and retrieve me a pineapple, hmm. would you? And a tad peckish. There's a good girl. Of course, Mr. Durden's room. There's a telephone call for you on line two. Oh. It's Mr. Van Swizzle. Van Swizzle? Hmm. I told him not to call me here. Can't they run things for two bloody weeks? Now, this better be an emergency of biblical proportion, so I'll have his eyes cut out. Hello? Van Swizzle, yeah. you boob. What is the meaning of this intrusion? We have a cold red, Mr. Gold. What? The satellite has come down from orbit. Egad, man. Say it's not so. Darling. Yes? Massage my temples, would you? Of course. I received a call from America five minutes ago. America? The satellite landed in a rural village of Biloxi, it is called, I believe. Biloxi. The local police officer called. He yeah. informed me that the satellite was indeed humming. Humming? Zounds. That means it's still functioning. Uh, meet me at the Heathrow Airport in four hours, Van Swizzle. We're going to Biloxi the minute we can book a flight. Yes. Pray for the sake of your career. We are not too late. Indeed, I will be praying. Oh. Why can't my life run smoothly? Hmm. After all, I'm rich. There, there now, Mr. Golden Spoon. Here's your pineapple. Put on a record on over record. there. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for your amazement, and for the Biloxi Gazette, Cecil Ferris, alias Dandy Daredevil, will defy death by jumping this 30 feet high and 50 foot long. Oh, uh, whatever it is. I can't believe you're doing this, Cecil. You're going to break your full neck or worse. Elmer, this is something I just have to do. Now, we're just going to see who's going to be on the front cover of the Biloxi Gazette tomorrow. Well, I know who's just liable to be in the obituaries. Cecil, that old motorcycle ain't going to jump that satellite. Sheriff, you got to do something about this. Uh, that old scooter, it's held together with chicken wire. He's going to break every bone in his body. Now, yeah, you just cool off, Elmer. He ain't going to hurt himself. We got an ambulance standing by in case he does. Besides, he's donating half the ticket money to the policeman's ball. Attention, everyone. Get your camcorders rolling. The depth-defying stunt will now begin. Sakes alive. Whenever you're ready, Cecil. Cecil, Cecil, get off that sickle. No. Come on, you ain't got nothing to prove. No. Let's go frog gigging. You hear that, Elmer? You hear that? I'm gonna be famous now. Now you just step back. I'm gonna jump that thing now. Here we go. Here we go.
Oh, dang. I hope that flimsy flyboard ramp holds up. Howdy, Miss Maddox, over Elmer, here. Elmer, I just got here. What's going on here, oh, now? Miss Maddox, it's Cecil. Thank fool's trying to find a quick way to a broken neck. Ripping it up, ripping it up. About to go. Keep going. Oh. Uh, did you see what happened, Elmer? The sun was in my eyes. Yeah, I, I seen it, Sheriff, but it happened so quick it took a second for my brain to process it all. Uh, season was just about halfway over that satellite in midair when his motorcycle just sucked out from under him and attached that satellite like it was a magnet or something. Poor old Cecil's up in that old willow tree. I'm a coming, Cecil. Just hang on to that willow branch. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the show is now over. Hey, give me back my mic. Hey! Confound it, can't you fly this jet any faster? Mm. The bleeding birds are passing us by. We're moving twice the speed of sound, Mr. Gold. Only Mark II? Are we in the Dark Ages or something? <sighs> Come alive, Van Swizzle. Oh. There's no time uh, for a lie down. What is it? How soon to Biloxi? Weather permitting, we will be there in approximately four hours. Uh, and uh, how much longer until... The zero hour. It would be approximately four hours and 44 minutes, to be precise. Oh, only four hours and 44 minutes, and my life could be ruined. This is not happening. I wish it all away. You are not alone in your despair. People could die, Mr. Gold. Oh. I smell a foul wind that grows danker by the minute. It reeks of lawsuits and lengthy prison terms. Oh, shut up, Van Swizzle, and go back to sleep. Oh. My only hope is they have the good sense to stay away from the satellite. Uh, uh, run over there to the satellite and stand next to your motorcycle, Cecil. I want to take your picture. Hey, Elmer, I thought we were going to tie up my motorcycle and try to pull it off this thing. Well, we will directly. I, I want to add this to my scrapbook of funny pictures. I'm going to put this one next to that snapshot of you with your tongue stuck to that frozen lamp post. Well, ain't I just the court jester here, Elmer? Well, I... Maybe I ought to get into comedy and make comedy movies and just make people laugh all the day gone time. Oh, right, now, come on, Cecil. Don't carry on like that. I could just spit. You know, somebody sent in a videotape of me making that jump to that old Channel 6 news. <laughs> I know, I know. i seen it. Uh, heck, I imagine the whole town seen it. <laughs> now, now, Cecil, you, you ought to be proud. That you're a celebrity now. It, it ain't everybody gets on the Channel 6 hometown blooper show. This is the most humiliating thing that ever happened to me. Oh, now, Cecil, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I, I think when you got your tongue stuck at that frozen lamp post last winter, I, I think that beats it out in the humiliation department. That's right, Elmer. Get your yucks like everybody else. Just call me Sir Joke a lot. I just wish you could see your face, Cecil. You look like you just got through sucking a bushel of lemons. I was just fooling you, dad gum. Cecil, every dog has his day, and, and your day in the spotlight's gonna come. You, you just mark my word. All you need to do is have a little patience. Now, now l l listen here. Uh, grab onto your sickle and, 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 and act like you're really trying to pull it off. Really, really bug your eyes out and, and, and make your tendon stick out in your neck like you're really straining it, all right? Let's make it funny. Anything to get this show on the road. Uh, all right. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh, I wish you could see yourself. Okay, Cecil, look at the birdie. I'm going to take this. Come on. Like someone's pulling the camera out of my hand. That I can't hold on to the damn gun thing. Ah! Oh, whoa, Elmer! That camera nearly hit me square in the face. Well, I, I, I tried to hang on to it, Cecil, but it felt like it was going to jerk my arms out of their socket. Well, let's get the sickle, Elmer. That's what we came here for. Well, all right, I'll make a stab at it. But hey, that satellite's got a strong magnetic hole. I don't think he wants to let go of your sickle. 
Uh, all right, I already got the rope tied to it. You holler if it starts to slip off my trailer hitch, all right? All right, Elmer. All right, Bessie. Okay, now. Let's put your back into it, darling. You can do it. Hug her down, girl. Come on. Come on, Bessie girl. Come on, you can do it. Come on, now. Oh, oh, come on, girl. Put your back into it. Dang, the tires are spinning. Oh, oh shoot, far. Uh, it just ain't worth stripping my gears for that raggedy old scooter. It ain't worth breaking a good rope. I, I'll just have to tell Cecil I, I just can't. Whoa! W- w- what's that humming sound? Golly, bum! Something's pulling the truck backwards. Dad, gum, that satellite's got it. Got my truck in its magnetic clutches. Uh, Lord in mercy. My front end's lifting up. It's rearing up on its back wheels. I'm gonna flip over. Uh, uh, I'm sliding into that thing. Ah! Yeah! Bad stuff. The truck is collapsing in on me. It's like being in a garbage compactor. Ah! Good Lord of mercy. Elmer, Elmer, you all right? You all right in there? Uh, well, uh, I, I've been better, Cecil. Uh, I feel more bruised than broken, though, so uh, I, I guess I'm all right. How do I look from your perspective? You look lucky to be alive, Elmer. Goodness, your truck is smushed up like an accordion. Oh, Lord. I know this is a stupid question, but, uh, did I crush your motorcycle? Yeah, it's junk now. Well, well, heck, let's face it, Cecil. It, it was junk to begin with. But I am sorry about it. Dang, I don't know how in the heck I'm gonna get out of this thing. Upside down in a crumpled up truck? <laughs> This looks like the sort of thing we'll laugh at later on, but it ain't very funny now. I can't move my left foot. It's caught under a jagged piece of metal. Yeah. Uh, would you go tell uh, Sheriff McRoy that I'm hung up like this? Sure. Uh, he's got the jaws of life, you know. Yeah, the jaws of life. I've always wanted to see one of them things work, Elmer. I'll be right back, quick as I can. Okay, thank you, Cease. Uh, uh, take your time. I, I'll be here when you get back. It just ain't no use, Sheriff. Elmer's still in that truck. We uh, tried everything. Tried the jaws of life. Yeah. Conroy Pip down at the Grease Monkey Haven body shop. He brought over his cutting torch. Yeah. But every time you bring anything near that satellite within 20 feet, yeah. swoop, clang. You can't hold on to it. I mean, that sucker's magnetized sure enough. Oh, Lord of mercy. What, did you try something wood rolling, a club or something? Well, ain't nothing wood strong enough to pry Elmer out of that truck, Sheriff. Bad gum. He's got his foot caught under the steering column. Oh, Lord. We got bad luck in abundance. You went down there, Doc Stone, and took a look at him. How's Elmer look to you? Well, sir, as near as I can see, it weren't no broken bones or nothing, knock on wood. I have to wait and see about that leg. Uh, rest or bruises, I'm sure Elmer will live, unless he starves to death. Bad gun. Oh, heck no, I don't think he's going to starve to death. Uh, Miss Maddox brought him over a squirrel pie and some mustard greens. Fed him to him through the vent window. Poor Elmer, caught in a two-ton wad of pickup truck, and it's all because of me. Well, ain't no time to worry about that, Cecil. The main concern is how to get Elmer out of there. You know, I hear tell sometimes a rabbit, when he's caught in a trap, will chew off his own foot to get out. Of course, I just mention that to make conversation. I'm not suggesting Elmer do that. Uh, Forgive. Forgive my intrusion, gentlemen. Huh? I I must speak to the the officer. Oh, well, right here, boys, right here. I'm Sheriff McElroy. Oh, uh, pleased to meet... Oh, so sorry. I've been running uh, from the limousine. That's okay. I am Conrad Goldenspoon from Innovatrix. Oh. It is a private scientific research firm. Oh, you, you're you're the satellite boy. Indeed, we are the satellite boys. Oh, yeah, yeah, from 1-800-BIG-BANG. Yes. Uh, you spoke to my assistant, Van Swizzle, over the phone. He could not discuss this matter in detail, I'm afraid. The phones have ears, you know. However... Big Bang is, well, it's sort of our attempt at glib humor. Uh-huh. The satellite will not explode, I assure you. It will, in fact, implode. Implode? Yes, in 20 minutes, approximately. The satellite is actually an antimatter device, you see. All living things and non living things are composed of matter, and science dictates that matter cannot be destroyed, but uh, we think we have found a way to do it. Well, uh, shoot, why did you want to do that in the first place? The primary goal would be waste disposal... 
plastics and the like, they take forever to decompose. Now they could be eliminated without a trace. Of course, this implosion was supposed to be tested in space. Uh Uh-huh. Gravity conspired against us. Uh Uh-huh, I know. And now this thing's going to go off right here in Biloxi, and you say 20 minutes? That is correct. It is rigged with a timing device. However, I do not think there's any need for any serious concern, Sheriff. We passed by this satellite on our way here. We found a few metallic objects attached to it. It is sort of a side effect. It increases in magnetism as it nears the implosion. This will occur in a 50-meter radius, which is quite small, actually. Yeah. As long as no one comes near the object, no one should be hurt. Oh, no. Uh, The satellite itself will be destroyed. A few trees. Uh, But other than that, I I think we're in the clear. Wrong, boys. Elmer Corn is caught in one of them metal objects clinging to that satellite. Caught in his pickup truck like a sardine. A possible fatality, Mr. Gold. Oh, I believe I'm going to swoon. We can't get Elmer out of there because of that magnetic field that thing has given off. we got to stop that thing from going off, boys. Oh. we got about 15 minutes left. Now come up with something. The only way, Sheriff, would be to have someone crawl into the satellite and disconnect some wires. It's a very small space, only about five decimeters wide. Only a child could fit. Yeah. Uh, just a second. I, I see so. Yeah. And why don't you show that man what you was doing at the bar the other day? Oh, that yeah. That you can do with your shoulders? Yeah, I can dislocate my shoulders. Watch this. <laughs> what does this disgusting display have to do with our dilemma? Oh, well, sir, I would imagine that Cecil can fit into a space about 10 or 12 inches wide when his shoulders are collapsed like that. Oh, that could work. That could work. My man... Are you willing to risk your life to save another? Say, I'd walk over hot coals to save Elmer. Well, keep them shoulders dislocated, Cecil. Let's go, boys. Cecil? Yeah. Cecil, Cecil, what in the heck are you climbing into that thing for? Now, do you just sit tight, Elmer? I gotta dislocate some wires real quick. Well, why, why is everybody keeping their distance? Come on, Cecil, give me some answers can't now. Do that, well, what's going on? Can't do that. Are you sure them walkie-talkies ain't gonna static out around that magnetic field? Oh, no, no. Uh, we designed these comlinks in our laboratory. They contain crystal circuits to function under magnetic conditions. What in the heck are y'all doing, Sheriff? Come on, tell me. I ain't nothing to fret about, Elmer. You just sit tight. Everything's gonna be okay. Uh, are you sure we're a safe distance from that satellite in case this don't, uh, you know, work out? Uh, yes, Deputy, yes. Uh, 60 meters is more than sufficient. Now, silence, please. I must talk to Mr. Ferris. Um, young man, approximately five meters into the tunnel, you will find a small hole to the right, about five decimeters in diameter. What the heck is a decimeter? Uh, I just looked for a small hole. This is where you will need to sit in order to disconnect the wires. All right. All right, all right. I see a small hole. It's right here. Uh, and uh, it's got a bunch of blinking lights in it. Good show, Mr. Dash. You found it. Now, look into the opening. You will see four colored wires. Four colored wires. I see them. Dad, gummit, this is a tight fit. Even with my shoulders bit like a boomerang. The blue wire. The blue wire. Do you see it? This connected as one. Blue? I can't tell which one is blue. This is very Stupidity, I'm colorblind. I'm just going to unplug them all. Dear God, no. No, Mr. Ferris. Don't do that. You'll trigger the implosion. Just get out of there at once. You have 30 seconds. Jeepers, I'm stuck. Lord have mercy. He can't get out of there. Hang on, Cecil. Me and Roland will get you out. Uh, Sheriff, deputy, come back. My worst fear confirmed. Hang in there. We're going to throw a rope in here, Cecil. Yeah, don't panic, old boy. What the hell's going on? Oh, no. They're gone. The police officers, Mr. Corn, Mr. Ferris, all gone. I've killed them all. That was a grim ending, wasn't it? Well, this is a morgue, you know. But but please, do not despair. This story has only begun. Do return next time, won't you? You will not believe what happens next. (laughs) 
Until then, pleasant dreams. You have just heard Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Moor. Today's installment, part one of 1-800-BIG-BANG. For correspondence, send to P.O. Box 252, Mejia, M-E-X-I-A, Texas, 76667. The names and characters portrayed in this production are fictitious. Any similarities with actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Production by MJ Audio Theater. Support for this program is provided by this and other national public radio member stations and the NPR Cultural Program Fund. Contributors include the National Endowment for the Arts and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. This is NPR National Public Radio. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. M&J Audio Theater presents Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. a seat. I am Chet Chetter, the morgue attendant and resident storyteller. <sighs> you may recall our last story ended with quite a cliffhanger. <laughs> it all began when a satellite re-entered the Earth's atmosphere and landed in the small town of Biloxi. A local and popular resident, Elmer Corn, discovered a toll-free number printed on the side of the satellite. It says, property of Innovatrix, a private firm. If this satellite falls to Earth, please call 1-800-BIG-BANG. Big Bang, that don't sound good. The word quickly got to Sir Golden Spoon, a supervisor of an independent scientific research firm. This is horrible, Van Swizzle. You say the satellite has fallen to Earth? Yes, indeed, and they also reported that it was humming. Humming? Zounds. That means that it is still functioning. Golden Spoon and his assistant immediately took a flight to Biloxi. Uh, however, before they could arrive, the satellite began producing a powerful magnetic pool. The magnetic field was so great, in fact, that Elmer Corn was sucked back in his truck and pinned to the satellite's side. That's my thing, that thing. Ah! 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 The truck is collapsing! 
wipes it in on me. It's like being in a garbage compactor. All attempts to free Mr. Corden from his mangled truck failed. When Sir Golden Spoon and his assistant arrived, they informed the sheriff that the satellite was designed to test an antimatter implosion in space. The implosion's detonation time was pre-calculated to go off in just 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Good Lord, boys, we got a problem. Elmer Corn's caught in his pickup truck and it's clinging to the side of that satellite. In order to stop the implosion, a certain wire inside the satellite had to be disconnected. And only one person could fit in such a small space. That was Cecil Ferris, Elmer's best friend. I can dislocate my shoulders. Watch this. Ugh. With Cecil's dislocated shoulders, he was able to fit in the allotted space with not an inch to spare. Unfortunately, Mr. Ferris was colorblind and unable to identify the correct wire to dislocate. And there was another problem. Jeepers, I'm stuck! Lord have mercy, he can't get out of there. Hang on, Cecil. Me and Roland to get you out. Uh, Chef, deputy, come back. My words to be a confirmed. Hang in there. We're going to throw it open to you, Cecil. Yeah, don't panic, old boy. Somebody tell me what in the hell's going on. Oh, no. They're gone. The police officers... Mr. Corn, Mr. Ferris, all gone. I've killed them all. Meanwhile, over one million years into the future... Uh, 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 pardon me, sir, but uh, I seem to have lost my way. Do you think you can point me the way to Larry's li liquor palace? Oh, oh, oh. Say, you look like a talking fire hydrant. I, I must really be loaded. So, say, would you like my cigar? I fell, I fell asleep in the gutter and got my matches wet. Silence. It is beating features, features, features. Uh -uh. You've become a foul odor and you are intoxicated. That's an it. Open the arena doors now. Well, now, wait just a cotton-picking picking minute. Boy, those are big doors. Where are we going? Silence. Walk forward into the arena, please, creature. Do not make me use the electronic probe. Well, I want to know what the heck is going on. Ow! Okay, okay. Don't suck me no more. I'm walking, I'm walking. You, you bully. All I wanted was the bloody Mary bitch anyway. I, I, hey. Hey, what the heck is this place? Some kind of newfangled indoor stadium or something? Hello? Hello, flesh creature. Can you hear me? I hear you, but I can't see you. Very good, very good. Welcome to the arena, flesh creature. You have been brought here to confront Terratron, the beast of steel. Do you have anything to say before we release the creature? I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, but I gotta go to the bathroom real bad. Oh, dear. They never have anything intelligent to say. Very well, let us begin. Do try to put on a good show, flesh creature. You are being televised throughout the world. Release this Terratron now.
Yes, I have psi senses, my crime. I am aware of this. Oh, how disappointing. He didn't even struggle. It's becoming tiresome. Every day is the same as another. We send a flesh creature into the arena and he is consumed by Teratron. Where is the challenge, I ask you? The intercession of the human was dulled by alcohol, Master. Perhaps we can send a flesh creature of higher intelligence to confront Teratron, one that is not heavily intoxicated. An intriguing concept, Micron, but you know there is a great risk involved. We cannot retrieve a flesh creature that is too intelligent. There are four flesh creatures in prison facility 2-0, Master. At first glance, their intelligence appears average. However, they are sober. They have arrived by their own means. Oh. We did not retrieve them. Arrived by their own means? But that is impossible. The, the flesh creatures never perfected time travel. Oh. Prepare my Land Rover, Micron. We will travel to the prison facility at once. I am very anxious to meet with these humans. into another world or something. That satellite. That's right. I was stuck in my truck and it was hanging on to that satellite. And Cecil, you was crawling into that thing. We didn't want to worry you, Elmer. That's why we didn't tell you what was going on. Cecil was going in there to try to dismantle the thing. The fellow what made that satellite said it was some sort of anti-matter device. Uh-huh. Said it was going to destroy everything in a 50-meter radius. And Cecil risked life and limb to try to stop it. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Except to... Uh, you didn't stop it, did you, Cecil? Well, yeah. Good Lord. I just got a grim thought, fellas. Suppose we didn't survive when that thing went off. Yeah, Elmer. What if we're in hell? Dang it, I should have got baptized when I had the chance. Well, if this is hell, it sure is a disappointment. I, I, I thought it'd be a heck of a lot hotter. Oh, I, I was just thinking out loud, Deputy. Yeah. I don't reckon we're in hell, no. Yeah. I, well, heck, we've been living good lives, more or less. Yeah, I know. We ain't killed nobody. Yeah. And... I don't expect they'd send us straight to hell without letting us stop over in purgatory to plead their case. Well, I hope you're right, Em. Good 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 Dad coming. Enough of this mindless chatter. Being attentive, flesh creatures, you are privileged. The master will speak with you personally. Kneel before his presence. Kneel in two feet of water? Forced to use the probe. Good Lord. Oh, heck no, let's don't make them use the probe, guys. Uh, let's swallow our pride and kneel, all right? Yeah, good idea, good yeah, idea. Good idea. Yeah. Oh, my. These are the flesh creatures you spoke of, Micron. These are the time travelers. Uh, excuse me there for a second, fellas. Uh, I'm Elmer Corn from Biloxi. Uh, I want to speak kind of on the behalf of my friends here. Uh, we don't know where the heck we're at, but uh, I did want to say whatever you got in store for us, uh, we ain't above begging for mercy if it'll do any good. Uh -huh. yeah. Silence, human. Dead. Inform the master how you arrived in the soft desert. Where is your time device? Uh, it would be wise to answer Micron's question, flesh creature. And be advised, a false answer can be easily detected. Where is your time device? Time device? We don't have no time device. Never had one, never will. Analysis, Micron. The humans speak the truth, Master. 
But how could they arrive without a time device? I think these robots are trying to tell us we're in another time. Say, where are we? When are we? What does AA mean? After Armageddon. After Armageddon? Dead. Oh, yeah. oh. Shocking, isn't it? These creatures obviously arrived by some sort of mysterious error. But it matters not. They were all into the arena, but you two will go first. Huh? Me and Cecil? Yes. You will confront Terratron, the Beast of Steel. And your friends will watch. Uh, Terratron? Well, sir, we'd love to in the worst way, but uh, we all took a vote and we decided we'd, we'd much rather go home. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, a sense of humor. How refreshing. Uh, Micron, put them all in shackles and direct them to the arena. Well, uh, uh, no, it's kind of hard to come up with something witty when you think you're about to die. I would like to know why we have to go through this, though. Oh, why, you are the entertainment. This is being televised throughout the world, so please, I beg of you, do scream for mercy and run in fear, cringe in terror, put on the best show you can. Uh, release Terratron now. Dadgummit, would you look at that? Lord, it's some kind of mechanical dinosaur. Cecil, if we get out of this one, I'm going to church more often. How about you? Ah! Come over here to the side of the arena. I got something for you. Uh, okay, Sheriff. Uh, keep it running, please, low buddy. I'll come back and help you just a second. Heads up, Elmer. I'm going to pull these things down to you. Well, it's a, a nine stick and a tape measure. Think on your toes, Elmer. That's all I got. They took my gun away from me. Well, heck, it's easy for you to say that, Sheriff. We're up here on the balcony. Help, Elmer. I'm cornered like a rat. Stay away from my buddy, you ugly mechanical critter. Come over here and eat me. I'll tear you loose from your hinges. Elmer, it's coming your way. Lord, what have I done? Say so. Say so quick. I'll throw you the receptacle end of this measuring tape, all right? I'll hold on to the measuring part. Hurry. Here, catch. Hurry. Uh, got it. Good boy. Now, you run to the left, and I'll run to the right. We're going to wrap that mama's leg with this measuring tape. Oh, I have messed with this display. Yeah, and he's gonna he's fall, fall too. Look, look out, out boy! Oh, look out, please! Oh. That's the time, Cecil. That's the time. We got him on his back now. Okay, now you start pulling wires out of that thing, and I'll start wailing on him with this nightstick. All right, all right. Chris, oh, oh, this is nice. Hey, take this, you little worm. Oh. Albert, got my leg. Hand hey. up. The critter's trying to stand up. Oh, no, you don't. That dog ain't gonna hunt. You can't stand with a broken back, you up. That's the end of that, Mama. Sell that sucker for scrap pot. Woo-hoo! Oh, most impressive. Highly entertaining. Oh, you are to be commended for your efforts, flesh creatures. Oh, you will all be my guests in the palace. My crown, prepare a feast for them. the one to look a gift horse in the chops, but uh, this here food is a little salty. Why, it is salt. Uh, food is non-existent. And, uh, the only thing that comes close is salt from the Atlantic Salt Desert. Atlantic Salt Desert? The Atlantic Salt Desert was once an ocean, stupid one. The nuclear holocaust destroyed the ozone layer. Massive global warming soon followed. 
all oceans evaporated. The remaining animal and plant life were destroyed as well. You know, this has been sticking in my craw ever since you first mentioned it. This uh, Armageddon, does it? Does it happen in our lifetime? Negative, Dull One. It occurred in the year 2250. The old world's leaders decided that planet Earth could not be saved from a devil's doom. As a result, they put the planet out of its misery and, may I add, very discreetly. Hmm. The only intelligent beings that remained were the service robots the flesh creatures had created. The most intelligent of these was the Master 2000. Only one prototype was created. Uh-huh. And I bet you that was you, wouldn't it? Yes. You are more intelligent than you appear, flesh creature. I was programmed to repair myself whenever necessary and to create more of my own kind. I began to repopulate the dead planet Earth. It took 10,000 centuries, mind you, but now the world has life again. We are a totally self-serving, non-violent, highly intelligent race. We have achieved everything the humans cannot. Boy, rubber face in it. Now, I have a question, flesh creatures. How in the world did you arrive over a million years ahead of your time? Well, as far as I can tell, that satellite sent us here. Satellite? Why, you naughty creature, you never mentioned the satellite. Well, now, you never asked us about no satellite. Yes, sir, uh, yesterday, I guess it was, uh, this satellite landed by accident in our hometown of Biloxi. And now uh, the fellow what made it said it was some sort of antimatter device. Said it was going to implode, destroying everything in a 50-meter radius. Well, we tried to stop it from going off, but uh, couldn't do it. We got caught up in the implosion, and bang, here we are. Matter cannot be destroyed, foolish one. Obviously, the satellite transformed your physical structures into minute particles and sent you through time. How foolish of that human to think he could destroy matter. <sighs> He created a time machine and did not know it. How terrible. We developed time travel 400 years ago. We found a crystal in an underground bunker. It was discovered during a flesh creature expedition of the planet Mars in the year 2103 AD. Only one of these crystals exists. Of course, the flesh creatures never found a use for the crystal. <sighs> But we discovered it to be a powerful source. It is the main source of power for our time device. Well, now, you go and call yourself a nonviolent race, and, and, and you sick a mechanical dinosaur on me and Cecil. And when I was in that arena, I saw a, a liquor bottle and a torn shirt. Has there been other people in that thing, too? Yes, many, many. You see, over the course of several centuries, we have developed one nagging human emotion boredom but we have nothing to do we don't have to work and we don't have to eat so we require some form of entertainment so we've been going into the past with our time machines and retrieving humans flesh creatures to send them into the arena you send folks into that arena to fight that monster just just to get your dad gum kicks? Shall I punish this flesh creature, Master, for his disrespect? <laughs> no, Micron, I can understand the human's anger. Let us go into my relaxation chamber. We can discuss these matters in a more inviting atmosphere. All right. Okay, okay sir. Right. You take the lead. Yep. That way. You see, we retrieve flesh creatures from the past, mostly what you would consider vagrants and lower-class citizens, nothing else. Well, uh, why don't you get some upper-scale folk? Well, you see, if we were to abduct an intelligent flesh creature, or worse, a computer programmer, it would seriously threaten our existence. I would hate to contemplate a worst-case scenario. Yeah, I get you, Drift. Like if you were to get someone who, uh, say, uh, designed robots, well, you could wipe out your own existence, couldn't you? Exactly. Uh, say, that, uh, that closet-looking thing over there in the corner, that, that ain't your time machine, is it? Yes, yes. But uh, we call it a time defier. These flesh creatures are becoming far too 
you inquisitive, Master. I suggest we begin the entertainment extermination immediately. Entertainment extermination? Yes. An intelligent flesh creature can be dangerous, you see. The four of you will confront Destructicon, a much larger and more powerful killing machine. You will surely die this time. Hell's bells. They're going to send us back to the arena. Release Destructicon now. Came right through that wall. Too many Christmas. All right, everybody, quick, run into that time machine. Oh, no, no, no. no. Right, kill Albert. them, kill them, Destructicon. Do not allow them to enter the time defier. Get into that thing. Okay, no, yeah. 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 Come on. All right, yeah. everybody, start pressing buttons and hopefully get this thing cranked up. All right, Ellis. Welcome to the time fire. Please press. Time and destination on the keyboard. Uh, well, I'm going to try to punch in when we left. I just hope... Oh, no. uh, oh, no. Destructicon's got us in its clutches, Elmer! Stop. Stop, Destructicon. Stop. You're destroying the time to fire. It's the only one in existence. Press the red ALEX key. Time travel will just commence. Red ALEX key? This thing is full of red keys. You start pressing red key, Sheriff. Yeah. Hear him, scare him, and do it quick. Uh, this creature's going to swallow his hole. The roof's caving in on us, Elmer. Time will now be defined. We are gathered here today to pay our last respects to four courageous men. Oh, really? Oh, oh. oh. good lordy. Oh. We're here, fellas. Yep. Wherever here he is. Welcome to 20th Century Biloxi. Population 600. Biloxi. Biloxi, I'm a ground kissing fool. We're home, fellas. Hey, 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 look, everybody. Elmer. It's Elmer in the game. Elmer, Elmer. Oh, I'm so glad you're home. Oh, yeah. Miss Maddox, Dad, go, we landed in church. Yeah. Uh, what's going on here? Well, sir, Elmer, we all figured you'd be deceased all for you. Uh, we was holding a memorial service for you. A memorial service for us? Dad, go. Huh. Walking in her own funeral, just like old Tom Sawyer. Uh, say, Luella, uh, play some happy welcome home music on that organ. Say, say, Alma, come uh, over here. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Should we tell everybody what we went through? Oh, no, 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 Cecil, I don't think so. Well, they're having such a good time, and besides, yeah, the future, going to the robots and all that, it's best we keep it to ourselves. Yeah, it's a kind of a grim future, though, ain't it, Elmer? Well, sir, Sheriff, I, I think it's best we don't dwell on such as that. If we learned anything by all this, it's to enjoy life now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And one that. more thing I think we've learned. What's that? Oh, it's to that? take a crowbar to that time machine. Yeah, well, that's yeah. That's a good idea. Good idea. Sheriff, I'm going to get a crowbar and a sledgehammer. Yeah, okay, you do that, Roy. Well, now, there you are. A tale about time. Hmm. Well, it's, it's certainly good that it's fiction. An unsettling thought, the robots taking over the future. No need for morgue attendance, or morgues for that matter. When a robot runs down, you just uh, send it to the scrap pile. Oh, you have to go, do you? Well... Do return for another story next time, won't you? Until then, pleasant dreams. You have just heard Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. Today's installment, part two of... 1-800-BIG-BANG. For correspondence, send to P.O. Box 252, Mejia, M-E-X-I-A, Texas, 76667. The names and characters portrayed in this production are fictitious. Any similarities with actual persons, living or dead, including robots, is purely coincidental. Hey, hey.
production production by M and J M and J audio audio theater theater. Support for this program is provided by this and other National Public Radio member stations and the NPR Cultural Program Fund. Contributors include the National Endowment for the Arts and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This is NPR National Public Radio. Winter has Louisville in its grip, and former FBI agent Dallas Powell has his hands full with car trouble, cat trouble, and trying to keep the Derby City branch of True Blood Investigations and Security, Inc. solvent. When a juicy insurance job comes his way, he jumps at it, but the discovery of a decades-old murder spawns a veritable blizzard of violence, and Dallas finds himself right in its path. Winter Wonderland A Dallas Powell Mystery by T. Lee Harris, narrated by Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines? Knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare, Espionage, International Intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. In today's adventure, The Secret Box, concerning an American agent who was sent into a Japanese-infested jungle to take back a prisoner. The role of John Marco, the OSS agent, is played by comedy star Jerry Lester. The story is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. I always carried this little box around with me. I never knew when it might come in handy. It was about as big as a small lunch box, and... Well, to begin at the beginning... I happened to be in the radio room at OSS headquarters in Bamo that night when the message came through. Have important Japanese... Captive for you. Can you come get him? Come soon. Jap patrol only few miles away. Again, for OSS headquarter in Bamo from Agent Terry. Have important. So that's how Harry Stevens and I happened to be in an AT-18 flying over Agent Terry's position about 86 miles behind enemy lines in Burma. And like I say, I had this little box in my knapsack. Oh, oh, in case I forgot to mention it, my name is Johnny Marco. Snappy songs and witty sayings. Just mention my name in Sheboygan. Oh, they loved me in Sheboygan. Yeah, yeah, I know, Marco. Hey, Harry, did I ever tell you about my last date in Frisco before I went overseas? I can hardly wait. Her name was Rose. She had a name like a flower and a face like a weed. Mm -hmm. I called her Cream of Wheat because she was so mushy. (laughs) Marco, I have but one thing to say to you. Well, talk to me. I hope you live to be as old as your jokes. You know the trouble with you, Harry? Mm -hmm. You don't realize you're carting around a million dollars worth of talent. I tell you, they loved me. In Sheboygan, I know. the city, yeah. Now hang on. I'm gonna take a dive, see if I can find the landing strip.
We had figured our checkpoints carefully. But when we reached our rendezvous, all we could see was a rough field with a Buddhist pagoda at the far end. Nothing else. No landing strip, no markers, no one waiting downstairs. Just a rough field covered with brush. We knew something must have gone wrong. I don't get it, Marco. Well, the Japs probably closed in and they're afraid to come out of hiding. Oh, great. Live Jap prisoners aren't dropped in our laps every day. Hey, Harry. Huh? Who is this Agent Terry, anyway? Oh, missionary. He's been working with a tribe of Anglo-Burmese for years. The colonel says he's already radioed back a lot of information on enemy positions. This is the first prisoner he's ever taken. What a rotten break. Well, look, circle around again. Maybe we'll see something. Better head back before we run into trouble ourselves. Hey, Harry, huh? Harry, look. Look, the brush. It's being yanked away. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Look, those natives. They're putting up the white marker stripes. The safe-to-land panel's out. It, gee, it's like seeing something pop before your eyes. Let's go. That landing strip came out of nowhere. Just all of a sudden, there it was. The plane bumped the ground and rolled in. But we kept the motor still running in case of a jab trick. And we sat there and waited for whatever was going to happen next. Harry! Harry, look! Look, look! Something or somebody's coming out of that clump of bamboo at the end of the field. Yeah. Keep your hand on your gun. I'll make a quick getaway if I have to. Check, check. Harry! Harry, natives! Yeah, but are they friendly? Spears! Hey, they're armed! Let's get out of here. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? There's a white woman with them. I am Mrs. Terry, gentlemen. One would never suspect I was an agent who had won. Well, uh, what's the angle? I mean, well, I beg your pardon, Oh, ma'am. it's very simple, really. My husband, the late Reverend Oscar Terry, a God-fearing man, went to his rest a few months ago. Well, you mean, ma'am, that, that you're the agent who's been sending all that information to OSS headquarters in Bamo? Naturally. Hmm. Uh, this is Lin Tao. I suppose you'd call him the right-hand man. Say, how'd you do, Lin? How you do? Hi. <laughs> Lynn, incidentally, sent the radio message. He does so enjoy tinkering with mechanical devices. I showed him how to use it. Unfortunately, however, my husband, the late Reverend Oscar Terry, a God-fearing man, was the only one of us who knew how to take it apart and put it together again. Uh, Lynn. Yes, Miss Terry? That radio, you have it? I uh, have it here. Excellent. Captain, would you either have this replaced in Bummo with new parts or have a new radio dropped over to us? Why, sure, Mrs. Terry. I'll see what can be done for you. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, fancy. I almost forgot. We have a Japanese prisoner for you. There were about a half a dozen natives a short distance away standing around the cart. In it, they had a Jap officer with his hands and feet tied. They dragged him over. Get down. He was a surly character. <laughs> Maybe I would be under the same circumstances. Anyway, he didn't say a word. Just glared at us from under the bloody bandage around his head. Here is your guest, gentlemen. Colonel Sawaka, the Japanese high command. He uh, resisted arrest rather strenuously, so it was impossible to avoid banging him around a bit. <laughs> Well, goodbye now, and good luck, and do give my regards to your colonel. We loaded Colonel Sawaka into the small plane. And a few seconds later, as we swung over the field, we looked down and saw that all trace of the strip had completely disappeared. The brush was replaced, and there was nothing. Only jungle. How's our friend Colonel Sawaka doing, Marco? Well, he's a little tied up at the moment. Hey, friend, how you doing? <laughs> friend doesn't want to talk. You know something? That's the best audience you'll ever have, Marco, one who can't understand English. Oh, come on now, will you, Harry? Hey, maybe you got some. Hey, friend, uh, did you know that the former ruler of Russia was called the Tsar? His wife was called the Tsarina? And you know what they called his kids? <laughs> 
Get a load of this. Sardines. <laughs> hmm, yeah. You know, I think you're right, Harry. Friend obviously doesn't understand a word of comedy English. Oh, hey, what's that? Jap Act Act, they've spotted us. Can we get away from them? Well, we can try. That's climbing, Harry. Gee, a thousand feet in about a half a minute. Ah, it's no good. Can't get out of range this way. Well, what do we do? I'll level off and head for home. I can't get away from him. I just climbing. You did it. We're out of range now. Uh, I, I, I uh, think. I just spoke too fast. Trouble? Ah, uh, Black must have hit one of the engines. It's knocked out. Oh, fine. Well, it could have been worse. I can get us back on one. Oh, brother, if you were your sister, I'd marry you. Oh, you're a big-hearted guy. You know that, Marco? Well, I don't go around All proposing right. every day. Yet. You better go back and see how friend is doing. Friend, Colonel Sawaka, doing extremely well. Thank you. What? Keep me your hands on the flying instruments, Captain. Hey! And you, Lieutenant, keep your hands in the air. Way in the air. I thank you. Oh, you dirty dog face. You spoke English all the time. Enough to tell you that if you do not do as you are told, I put the bullet through your head. I thank you, Lieutenant, for leaving gun within easy reach. Can you do anything, Mark? Quiet. Nothing. He's got us. Quiet. Do not talk. Just continue to fly a plane. So Harry kept the plane steady. His back to our friend. And I just stood there and watched Colonel Sawaka as he manipulated the parachute and buckled it on, changing the gun from one hand to the other as he put his arms through the straps of the chute. Then he opened the handle of the waste door. I will say goodbye now. It was unpleasant to ride. Why, you... Hands dirt. in the air. Keep the hands in the air. Much better. <laughs> now I shoot you both. Then I jump... Yeah! Goodbye, friend. Don't forget to write. The jerk shouldn't have opened a waste off first. All I had to do was bank the plane over on its side, and we lost him. <laughs> yeah, we lost him, all right. Uh-oh. His chute open. Oh, fine. Well, uh, mission unaccomplished. Well, anyway, it was a nice ride. I'm glad you thought so. Uh-oh. The second engine couldn't take the strain of that flip-flop. Is it conking out? Yeah. It cocked. All right, hit the silk, Marco. We better bail out. I made it okay. Rolled over a couple of times when I landed and pulled the chute down. But it was another story with Harry. As he bailed out, his, his, his slipstream caught him, flung him back against the horizontal stabilizer and cut a gash in his head. Miraculously, his chute opened. And he drifted into the green jungle and landed upside down in the top of a tall mahogany tree. Harry! Harry, are you all right? Can you talk? Marco, shroud line of the chute. They're tangled. Can't get out. My head, I cut it. Yeah, I see. Marco, get me down. Yeah, yeah, easy boy now. I'll do something. Something? But what? tried to climb the tree to reach him. But it was no use. The trunk was bare, smooth, and I kept slipping back. It was as if the two of us were in the middle of a nightmare. Harry! Harry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can't climb that lousy tree. It's too slippery. There's nothing for me to hold on. Marco, it's no use. Well, oh, what do you mean it's no use? If you waste time standing there, you'll be caught... The Japs all around, you know that as well as I do. Harry, will you listen to now me? Now you listen to me. Get away now, will you? They may have seen the plane. Oh, shut up now, will you shut up? Get out of with both dead ducks. I know I am anyway. Just do one thing. Marco? Yeah? Don't leave me here to starve or fall into Jap hands. Maybe you can make it back alone. You're nuts now. I, I couldn't do that. Just don't leave me to starve, Marco, please. Please, huh? Shoot me first. Through the head, Marco. Please. I knew he was right. I couldn't leave him. Please, Marco. Not that way. And I couldn't stay. Marco! Well, I took the forty-five from the holster at my belt. 
When I heard the dry click of the hammer being drawn back, I, I broke out in a sweat. My hands started to get wet, too. Marco. I counted one, two. Well, listen. What? From the looks of it, we are right in time. Lin Tao and the natives went to work swiftly, knocking down a second smaller tree against the mahogany. They scaled it like cats to the base of the branch where Harry was hanging, tossed a loop of rat tan across the branch and pulled it toward him. Then they lifted Harry and passed him from hand to hand and lowered him gently to the ground. And all the time I just stood there next to Mrs. Terry, feeling the blood pounding in my head. And I put the pistol back into my holster. Lynn, that other bandage, please. Here. Here you are, Miss Terry. That's a good fellow. Thank you so much. Uh, how's your head now, Captain Stevens? Oh, much better, thanks. I still don't understand. How did you oh, happen... we saw to... the Japanese Akak hit your plane almost immediately after you left us. And we came along to the jungle in case there should be need of us. Lady, no one ever needed you more. You say Colonel Sawaka escaped? Dear, yeah. dear, what a pity. Now, now, I think that bandage will do till you get back. Miss Terry. Yes, Lynn. Uh, Lynn ta say, leave now. Do not stay. Back to village. Oh, yes, quite. But that poses a problem. As I told you earlier, our radio is out of use. So, so... there's no way of contacting headquarters and telling them to send a plane for us? Exactly, Lieutenant Marco. Well, uh, d d do you think we can make it back through enemy lines on foot? Mm, possibly. It'd take five or six days, anyway. Yeah, but it could be done, couldn't it? I, I, I mean, we could sneak through, couldn't we? Bypass the Japs, so I don't care. Can do. Yeah. Lin Tao help. Thank you. Capital idea, Lin Tao. My husband, the late Reverend Oscar Terry. A, a God-fearing man. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. He would approve heartily. <laughs> Lin Tao knew plenty of shortcuts, and we followed him, skirting Jap patrols all the way. There was something uncanny about the way he led us over miles of jungles. We kept our packs light because we had a pretty long hike ahead. But just the same, I kept that little box with me. I never knew when it might come in handy. Then we came to a small stream. Ah, uh, must go to stream here. Take off shoe. Well, well, wait a minute, Lynn. Why bother? We'll be wading through a lot of water, and, and why take our shoes off and on? Oh, what? Don't ask Lynn say. If shoe get wet, feet wet all time. Many saw come on feet. Will not be easy for you to walk much distance to Bamo. We crossed several more brooks, and we kept taking our shoes off and on. On and off. The jungle along the banks grew thinner. And so did we. The sun beat down harder. And the water washed sand up around our knees. The shoes off and on. On and off. We'd splash and then stumble. And then start walking again. A couple of days of this, we were pretty beat. Except for Iron Man Lynn. Ah, oh, feel good, Lynn. Then the sun, I'll have to hold up a while. Uh, we'll rest here. Near scream. Hey, this is an ideal spot for a picnic. <laughs> Fifty million insects can't be wrong. Ah, got you first, you little foreigner. Hey, Marco, got any water left? My canteen's dry. Yeah, sure, here. Yeah. It's all you got? It's okay. Go ahead, drink it. Lynn, this is all the water we got? When thou say, do not worry. Watch. I will show what to do so you know. Hey, wait a minute. What are you digging a hole in the sand? Watch. First, dig... Small hole in sand near stream. Place leave in bottom, like this. Now when water come to sand and leave, it not be muddy. Can drink. Hey, that's the greatest. The leaves act like a filter, you mean. Uh, water is clear. Uh, drink it with your hand. It will not hurt you now. This Lin Tao had a dozen cute little tricks like that. <laughs> He'd have been a riot in vaudeville. Well, the next morning, we were back on the trail, pushing our way through sharp blades of grass. 
And all of a sudden, we heard the tinkle of an iron bell. Hey, Lynn, what's that? Escape book, elephant coming. Dangerous. Villager in jungle put iron bell on our neck to warn. Dangerous. We've got guns. We've got guns. Let's shoot at them from no, the side. No, 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 no. Do not shoot. If yeah, but... Yeah. not go too high, don't only make the elephant much angry. Do not shoot. Uh, still, the size of them. Look at the size of them. It's like being charged at by a six-story Still, building. still. Do not shoot yet. O- only if we must... Right by us. Yeah. Maybe he didn't think we were worth noticing. You know something, Harry? Huh? One thing I can't figure out about an elephant. With a tail at both ends, how does he know which end to sit on? Oh, <laughs> funny man. Come on, let's make time. Lin Tao did our seeing and our thinking for us. He did everything but walk for us, and we got sort of used to leaning on him. Nothing could happen to Iron Man Lin. Only it did. Lynn! Lynn! Harry! Harry, he's dead! That knife went right in his back! Where'd it come from? They came out of the jungle. At least 50 of them. Half naked savages carrying long stalks of bamboo that had been sharpened to deadly points. Their leader was a giant. Must have been about six foot seven. He held up his hand. And the sudden silence scared us more than the noise. Quam. Dunley. What did he say? Did you understand him, Harry? Uh, look. Friends. Friends. Savvy friends. No. No friend. Quam. Dunley. White devils. White devils. That was us. They slashed off pieces of the vine ropes around the tree and twisted them about us so we could just move our legs. Then they pushed us ahead of them, through the gray daylight of the jungle, through the dim passages of winding lianas, the climbing tropical plants. And above us, stray birds shot color through the overhanging trees. After about a mile, the path became a trail. The lianas were cut away. We tripped over some coconut husks by the side of a charred fire. We were coming into the village. Then Harry saw them first. Marco, look. Up there on the poles. Human heads. A row of skulls. Headhunters. Marco, these are headhunters. Move. Quam Donnelly, move. Hey, look, Chief. Chief, you got it all wrong. Now, now, now we're not devils. We're friends. Friends. No. No. It's no use, Marco. American, you are right. It's no use. Colonel Sawaka. I am a great friend of these headhunters. For I warned them of your coming. Told them you are Quan Dan Lee. What devils who come to bring a plague and a pestilence to them? Uh, you've not it's right. no use. Chief, put the devils away. Then, Quan Dan Lee, I... Basha! They untied us and threw us in a straw thatched hut they called a Basha. Through the makeshift door, we could see the skulls on the poles. An endless row of them under the hot sun. And up the poles streamed columns of jungle ants, giving them an ancient burial. Uh, looks like the end of the line, Marco. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, Harry. Uh, that chief speaks a little pidgin English. He understands a little. Do you think we could reason with him? Uh, he doesn't look like a reasonable type. Besides, our friend, Colonel Sawaka, got to him first. The tribe's convinced we're dangerous. Yeah. About as dangerous as a glass of buttermilk. A funny bucket. Yeah, that's Sawaka outside talking to the guard. And, uh, we got company. I trust you are comfortable, Captain, Lieutenant. Why don't you climb a tree, you little monkey? Ow! Watch your tongue. <laughs> Was the most fortunate for me. I found a way here to a friendly camp. Sorry, I don't like your friends. <laughs> My friends do not like you either. Think you are devil Americans who bring evil to their people. Sleep well. Tomorrow you will join heads on poles. <laughs> morning they brought us out. 
I guess we were pretty important because the big chief himself came over to tie us to the poles. <laughs> then I got an idea. I sneaked my hand in my pocket and grabbed a coin, just held it tight. Guam Don Lee, tie you now. Hey, chief, look at this. What are you doing carrying dimes around in your ear? Oh. Well, what do you know? Another in your other ear. Huh? Huh? And here's one in your nose. Toba. Say, you're a pretty sly character, aren't you? Regular walking bank of England. Hey, Marco, what are you up to? Just a couple of magic tricks if I can get away with them. I tell you, they love me in Sheboygan. Toba. Magic. That's right. Toba magic. Toba. Now, if you get me that knapsack you grabbed for me, I'll do more. See? Toba. Knapsack. Bag from back. Savvy? Remember, we'll do Toba. Do not listen to Kwan Dali, but off ahead. Now, hey, now. Chief, look at this. Look at this. Now you see it? Now you don't. How about now? Presto, coins disappear. How about now? Get knapsack or you'll disappear. Savvy? Good sharp plume by Kuna. Boy, that coin trick got him, and the chief pushed Sawaka aside and sent one of his rover boys to get my knapsack. They brought it to me, and I took out the little box. I always knew it would come in handy sometime. Then the chief held up his hand again. And I went into my act. Brother, what an audience. And what a performance. Now watch closely, ladies and gentlemen. The hand is quicker than the eye. Resto changeo. I take this little glass of water, just an ordinary glass of water, if you will observe closely, and presto, it turns color. <laughs> You're doing great, devil, kid. What about the, the shows? <laughs> I tell you, cut off of the head. Still. Be still. You tell him, chief. The devils are devils. Go away, little man. You bother me. Now, for the next bit of magic, ladies and gentlemen... <laughs> I pulled every trick in the book out of that little box. Drew cigarettes from the chief's ear. Pulled flowers out of empty pots. Yanked a dozen colored scarves out of a single white handkerchief. And then I broke a stick in half and put it together again. Boy, did they love it. And now, for my final bit of hocus pocus, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Marco, why don't you try saw Sawaka in half and forget to put them together again? I got something better. Huh? As I was saying, the devils, these American devils, Cuba. Hey, Marco, he's getting them over on his side. They're coming after us. Maybe this will stop them. Look, look, watch. Sorry, sign from gods. Okay. Look. Stopped him all right. I pulled a bean blower out of the box, blew hard, and out came a tiny doll dressed in a Jap uniform. Without his head. And he floated to earth. The superstitious native stepped back, afraid to come any closer. See? See, sign! Japanese is Kwandan Lee. God say so! Americans, friends, friends! Doll there on the ground. Japanese doll. Sign from gods. Follow great white father and fight Japanese. Chief, you tell him. He told him, all right. The big trouble we had afterwards was keeping them from tearing Sawaka apart. We wanted him alive to take back to OSS headquarters in Bamo. Well... That's the story. The next day, the headhunters led us back through the jungle with our prisoner. There's only one thing I'm sorry about. Too bad Variety couldn't have caught my act. I tell you, they loved me in Burma. Captain Harry Stevens and Lieutenant John Marco safely delivered Colonel Sawaka to OSS headquarters in Bamo, where he gave valuable information on Japanese war industry and finance. And so, once again, the report of another OSS agent closes with the words... Mission accomplished. Listen again next week for another true adventure from the files of the OSS on... Cloak and Dagger. Star 
starred in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure as Marco was Jerry Lester, with Larry Haynes as Harry, Colonel Sawaka, Daniel Ocko, Mrs. Terry, Irene Hubbard, the Colonel Raymond Edward Johnson. Others were Carl Weber, Arnold Robertson, and Jerry Jarrett. The script was written by Winifred Wolfe and Jack Gordon. The music was under the direction of Murray Ross. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This has been a Louis G. Cowan production in association with Alfred Hollander as it was under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. The manufacturers of State Express 3-5 Silter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. strange noises coming from above. Oh, don't let it worry you. It's merely the articulation of a worried corpse. He finds that he cannot enter into the spirit of the thing. taste of new smooth State Express 3.5 today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth Fig Express 35 today. Oh, 
mournful churchyard, the friends gather in the fog to mourn a dead man. An organ drones over the scene. The coffin is lowered into the earth, and the sad mourners don't even watch each other. It is a day of truce. Poor old Butch. Who would have thought his heart was so bad? Yeah, Red. Who would have thought it? Yeah. Well, listen to us all, Carla. It could be any one of us. Now, if he'd died of violence, I could have understood it. That cop, Inspector Sharp, he's watching you. Huh? Oh, the rat. Don't he show any respect on a day like this? Shh. It's coming over. Hello, Red. Hello, Carla. Huh? Hello, Inspector Sharp. Happy now? Happy? Which was a good friend of mine. Carl says he's your biggest enemy and you know it. Oh, what a thing to say. If you'd killed him, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. It's a lie. I never done it. I was frank. Oh, I know he's dead. It's natural. Dr. Wall says so and everything he says is true. That's right. He signed the death certificate. Yeah, you've got no grounds for suspicion. Unfortunately, no. See you around, Reed. And you, Carla. I'm off now. The obsequies is over. Obsequies? Yes, the funeral rites. Mm. Don't be so suspicious, Red. Bye now. He would be missed. No, Red, nobody could say that. Besides, so think of the things he controls, eh? All the best records, gambling machines, the racetrack bookies, protection and clubs. Yeah, they do say a little spot of drug running. He got too big for his boots, he did. Yeah, and all the mobsters in the city will be running around like dogs looking for the master. Hey, Carla, imagine if I was your master. <laughs> that would be the most, Red, but you ain't. That's right, but I could be. I'd be governor of the whole scene. Carla... You used to know Butch well, didn't you? Yeah, I knew him since we were kids. Tell me, who would be second in the gang? I mean, after Butch. Black called Kentish Jack. Tough in a fight. Huh? He is, is he? <laughs> I wonder. that, eh? You got me properly snookered, Reed. Yeah, Charlie, and you ain't the only one either. You mean the old Butch Hennessy mob? Yeah, it could be, boy. Now, look, Butch died from natural causes. Kentus Jack was shot by an unknown assailant. Who runs that mob now, eh? No, I'd rather play this game, Reed. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, we don't keep racketeering up forever, boy. That's the mistake people make. They don't know when they've had enough. Uh, the way I see it, clean up in a year or two. Goes with the harm of somewhere like that. Uh, what do you say? Reed, nobody ever quits the records. Never. 
Everybody knows too much. No, they don't quit. Unless they go the way Butch Hennessy went. Well, Kent is Jack come for that. Well, the way I... Oh, that's the signal. Must be the cops. They're on their way. Yeah. But don't worry, boy. They can be on their way. They got nothing on me. Morning, boys. Uh, hello, Inspector. Curtis Jack was killed last night, Red. So I see from the paper. Why, you didn't have anything to do with it, did you? Perhaps. Well, whatever can you mean, Inspector? Well, we got no motive. Only his rackets, eh, Red? <laughs> Red, you started something I'm going to finish. I won't have violence in the city. I'm a peace-loving man, Inspector. You got me all wrong, honest, Jab, Mr. Sharp. Red, you'll end up in jail for life or face downward in a gutter. And I'll laugh, believe me. Understand this, Red. Break the peace of this city and you'll be destroyed. <laughs> That's a threat, Inspector. I don't have to threaten a rat like you. Your own kind will destroy you. Red, did you know that Butch Hennessy left a lot of money? No. Besides, I wouldn't touch that kind of money. Maybe you wouldn't. Or couldn't. But somebody has. There wasn't a penny in his safe deposit box. Been cleaned out. I had nothing to do with it. Over 50,000 quid. Gone with the wind. 50,000 quid. Uh, oh, fancy that. That's eh? right. And the old underworld will be looking for it. Hard cash red. And I've heard that Butch isn't sleeping so soundly about it. Uh, what do you mean? They tell me that his ghost has been seen. That's all, Red. Carla, I tell you, I don't feel safe. Even in my own flat. That's all nonsense, Red. There's no such thing as ghosts. Everybody knows that. I don't know it. Have another drink, Red. Right, yes, I will. Look... When I was in Carmore Jail, there was a ghostly cell. The door used to swing open when there was nobody there. You couldn't lock it or nothing. Yeah, I believe in ghosts, all right. Yeah, but not ghosts of blokes like Butch Hennessy. I do, I tell you. If there's ghosts of old geezers with their heads cut off, why not of a smart boy like Butch? Well, what would he be looking for, Red? <clears throat> to, uh, <sighs> revenge, that's what. Revenge for the death of Kentish Jack Carla. Now, look, they say all his money's gone. Where? That's what I want to know. Who's got it? Is it a lot, Red? Well, that copper sharp says it's 50,000 quid. Any mob would go after that kind of money. But where would that much money vanish to? That's what I want to find out. Starting with our late friend, Kentish Jack. Look, I'm a fair cracksman. I'll take Charlie and we'll do Jack safe. Oh, I'll bet there's nothing there. Yeah, well, there may be some kind of clue. We'll try it anyhow. Jack's place is up at the top of a high building. I bet nobody's took it over yet. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We climb the fire escape, and then... Right. Now come in, Charlie. Escape was easy. Here, we'll shuffle and follow me. You got your gun? Hit right here, Reed. I got the torch, the tools, the lock. Okay. Now for the safe. Anywhere. Butch, come up and show yourself. <laughs> I 
you worried, boys? Well, I... Uh, Butch, look. <laughs> I've nothing to do with your death, honest. Where is he, Wade? I shine your torch. There. <laughs> nothing? Are you looking for something, boys? There it is again. Look, that voice is coming from the next room. That's all. The skylight's open. Then we'll soon find out. <laughs> Nobody's there. Look, there's the stairs going down. Come on, quick as you like. <laughs> there he is. Get him. We'll soon find out if he's a ghost. <laughs> Clean away, Charlie boy. He ain't a ghost, that's for sure. But it don't make sense. You saw him buried. Old Doc Moore signed a certificate. That's right. And what I want to know is this. Who was in that coffin I saw buried the other day? And there's only one way to find that out. You mean, uh, uh, have a look? Yes, that's just what I mean. We'll have to dig up that coffin tomorrow night. Now, let's get out of here before we get pinched. Oh, I don't like it, Red. Uh, that was a lovely shot, Charlie. Boy. No, I don't mean that. I mean, well, well, digging up that corpse... It's a bad thing to do, disturbing corpses. Yeah, any better suggestions? No, I suppose not. <sighs> then play a shot like a good little boy and leave the thinking to me, will you? No, I don't feel like playing, Red. Oh, go on. Do you think I like waiting the whole day? I'm scared, I tell yeah, you. Well, I'm scared too. I don't like ghosts and never did. I need to get hold of the rackets. And nothing's going to stop me, human or inhuman. Oh, well, you're the boss. Because I think that's why. Which uh, is alive, get it? He's no ghost. Then why pretend he's dead? Look, you said a true word the other day, Charlie. You said villains like us never leave the rackets because nobody will let them. And suppose Butch Hennessy wants to be the first man to walk out. You've got Ed on you, Red. Say Butch pretended he was dead. That way, he'd be in the clear. Yeah, well, then who was in the coffin you saw buried? The money, Charlie. Uh... The lovely money we want to get our hands on. in world class. Get the taste of new smooth Safe Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth Fate Express 3.5 today. Hunting in graves can be very dangerous, you know. However, let's find out what the police want with Charlie and Red, shall we? Yeah, I bet it's that copper shop. Yeah, well, what's in now? Ah, lovely shot, Charlie. Morning, boys. Uh, hello, Inspector. Why, if it isn't Mr. Sharp, eh? Someone broke into a safe last night, I thought you'd like to know. Well, I never. The things people do for a few quid. The robbers were armed and fired a gun at somebody. That's or a, something. That's a serious charge, that is, isn't it, Inspector? You wouldn't know anything about it, would you? Me? But I was home all evening. Oh, wasn't I, Charlie? Oh, yes, we was at home. Anybody hurt Mr. Sharp? Not this time. But I don't like guns and I don't like safe breakers. And I didn't tell you that both you boys are in serious trouble. Mr. Sharp, we can't be in much more trouble, can we? Oh, it's Butch Hennessy. He ought to know. No, he's dead, Mr. Sharp. Yeah. Do you believe in ghosts, Charlie? Uh, how about the kids, Inspector? Well, the whisper's gone around that Butch has come back from the dead. And then you fellas don't believe in ghosts, do you? So, uh, that's all right. 
Well, you don't believe in ghosts, do you, Mr. Sharp? I don't know, Charlie. I don't know. I didn't. Once. Enjoy your game. Oh, well, he's gone fast enough. Yeah. But you've got to use your head in this racket. The point is, why did he come here? What's he after? Us. He'd give good money to put us in jail. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I think. He came here to rack us. Act as if nothing happened. Look, I'm going to see Carla, and we'll meet tonight. Okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I wish it was all over, Red. I'd rather face a squad of cops than that graveyard tonight. How's the girl? All right, Red. Like a drink? Uh, yeah. Thanks, kid. <clears throat> Anyone been along? Not a soul. Sit down and relax. <clears throat> yeah, I thought that some of them nosy coppers might have been along. That Inspector Sharp, somebody like that. No one, Red. You're just jumpy. I keep thinking of what I see him on the street everywhere. Then you turn round and he isn't there. Here's your drink, Red. Hmm? How did you see Butch? We saw him buried. I'm not so sure. That's the end of him. Look, you're safe up here in this block of flats. If you lock the kitchen door, no one can get in by the fire escape. That leaves the front door, and if you put the chain on it... Oh, you have got it bad. Oh, no one will come in here, silly. Yeah? Well, maybe. But better safe than sorry. There. And you see, if Butch is alive, he might come after you. Yeah, I suppose you're right, but I... What's that? A cat. The wind, anything. Yeah. That noise came from the bedroom. Nobody could be in there. Nobody. Of course not. <laughs> it's Butch. He's in the bedroom. Oh, that's nonsense. Yeah? Well, I'm going to see. See? There's uh, nobody there. Yeah? Well, he must be hiding. Come out of there. Well, why don't you look under the bed? Look, I'm sorry, Carla. I'm jumpy, that's all. But I could have sworn it. Look. Didn't you hear a laugh? No, of course not. I thought I heard a bump. Yeah, well, well, let's go back to the living room. Okay, Red. I see Butch everywhere. Well, I don't see him. I hear him. If he ain't a ghost, he's mighty like one. Well, I didn't hear anything anyway. Look, lad, I'm going to settle this one way or the other tonight. Charlie's coming with me, and we'll dig up Butch's grave. I reckon the money's there. The money? Yeah. Look, Carla... I'm going to spend all the day well out of Ennis's way, see? There's something you can do for me. Oh, anything at all, Red. You know that. Take this gun and ditch it. The clip, ammunition and everything. It's the gun I used to kill Kentish Jack. And it's too hard to carry, understand? Whatever you say, Red. Good. I've got a sort of feeling that something's going to happen. I'll get picked up or something. So drop it in the river. Sure, Red. I'll put the gun where no one will ever find it. Where will you spend the day? Where no one will ever find me, kid. That art gallery. So long, love. So long, dreamboat. Butch. Butch? You can come out now, he's gone. Thanks, Carla. Oh, it was a bit clumped in that wardrobe. Well, you had to make a noise. That was the only way. I didn't expect him to dare. If he had found me, it would have meant a show down here. <laughs> you make a lousy ghost. Oh, I don't know. I groan and crackle very convincingly, Carla. <laughs> <laughs> that poor boy, oh, he doesn't know if I'm dead or alive. You've been seen too much, Butch. Butch Ennis is a chap people don't forget in a hurry. I've still got her fixed up, Carla. I'm dead. We pick up that money from the graveyard and scram the both of us. Just you and me. Sure. Leave these boyos to look for the ghost. <sighs> I'll quit the rackets. Come with me overseas. A new life is waiting for us. I'll invest in legitimate business, okay? Sounds wonderful. Butch, why aren't the money in your coffin in the first place? Doesn't make sense. Don't you see? It's in cash. Small notes, negotiable currency. Every racketeer in the place was after it. I had to hide it somewhere. Remember what happened to poor Kentish Jack, safe? That's right. 
Did you square Dr. Moore? Sure, he signed the death certificate for money. Morley, the undertaker, too, he worked for money. No, Carla, I've been seen around, but people think I'm a ghost. I'm the first man to break clean as a hound's tooth with a racket. You make it sound wonderful, Butch. I hope it stays that way. I swear it will. Everything's fixed. All we have to do is go to the grave and dig up that coffin. Well, you better be fast, Irish, yeah, because Red's got the same idea. <laughs> Has he now? I wonder what I'd do without you, baby. <laughs> This is the place, Red. Uh, sure. Uh, understand what we do? We get in that graveyard and start digging. Yeah, I'm with you, Red. The dough's there for certain. All right. That's it. Uh, are you sure, Red? Yeah, certain. I saw him buried here, didn't I? Or at least I saw something buried there in this grave. Besides, look at the earth. It's just been turned over. Yeah, that's right. It's all loose. Let's start digging. Now, come on, put your back into it. Yeah, well, I am trying, mate. What was that? It was an owl, Red, that's all. Yeah. Well, I don't like owls. I don't like this place. I don't like any of it. It smells wrong to me somewhere. What do you mean, Red? I don't know. Something creepy there. There's something wrong. Yeah. This earth shovels too easy. Yeah, well, we'll soon know one way or the other. That's the coffin in. Come on, let's dig it out. There. I reckon that'll do it. Yeah. Right. I'll take a spade and leave it off the lid. There's a fortune in this for us. There. It's done it. Ah. Let's see ya. Well, what is it, Reed? Take a look. It's Butch Hennessy's corpse. Yeah, Who's that? Carla! Shh, she shot him. The money. Oh, we shouldn't have come. I told you the old thing's crazy. Carla? What are you? What have you done with the money? The money? It ain't there. Not a cent. Carla, I'll get you oh, if it's the last it's thing I... Carla, Bill! Who's that? Carla, Bill! Carla, Bill! Carla, Got you this time, Red! Oh, uh, well, we got you into the cells at last, Red. Yeah, what for? We was found robbing a grave, so You've what? got a lot of explaining to do. The grave of a criminal who was supposed to have died four days ago. Our police surgeon says hennessy has been dead for less than six hours. I never shot him. It was Carly. You heard her. She was at the gravesite. Don't give me that. We've got the automatic found by the gravesite with the fingerprints on it. It was Carly. Save Can't your breath she... and tell it to the judge. Look, you know she was by the grave. You must have been following her for days. Otherwise, how would you have been by the gravesite? I told her everything. Now you're trying to frame me for shooting Butch. You're wrong, Red. Carlos confessed to shooting Butch. We are holding you on a charge of murdering Kentish Jack, otherwise known as John Garseed. I'll be seeing you. The rotten, filthy... <laughs> no, not again. You're dead this time. I saw your corpse. <laughs> this time you must be a real ghost. <laughs> for poor Red and his friend Charlie. However, the confusion will soon be resolved after they pay the penalty. Once they've made the big drop, the four of them, Kentish Jack, Carla, Red, and Charlie, will all be meeting here, behind the creaking door. <laughs> <laughs> Moon 
in World Class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5 today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new, smooth, Fate Express 3.5 today. host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door, of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3.5's Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present The Creaking Door. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. is a savage deity. Is that you, Dolores? Yes, Warner. Don't stop playing. I heard the music coming from the conservatory, so I stopped by. What are you playing? Just, just a simple melody of my own. So weird. I thought possibly you were playing a dirge. A dirge? Yes, or Andrews. I fear neither dirge nor prayers nor candles burned on the altar will do Andrews any good. Oh, Warner, what made him do it? He was always so happy, so full of the love of life. Why did he do such a thing? He was blind. He couldn't stand the thought of being without the use of his eyes, so... Yes, but if only... I cautioned him. Over and over again, I warned him to take care of his eyes. But he wouldn't listen to me. 
Now he's dead. Poor Andrews. I suppose you and James will postpone your marriage a while, Dolores? Yes, I, I think it best, don't you? It wouldn't be quite decent to have a funeral today and a wedding day after tomorrow, would it? I wouldn't permit it in my home. And this is still my house, you remember. Oh, now, who's that? Yes, come in. All right, Alma, what is it? Beg your pardon, Miss Jarvis. All right, all right, out with it. Don't stand there stammering. Yes, Miss Jarvis. It's for Mr. Loris. Mr. Harvey's here. Oh, Jim said he'd drop by. Shall I show him in here, Mr. Loris? Yes, please do. Yes, ma'am. By the way, Alma. Yes, ma'am? How does your head feel today? Not so good, ma'am. It ached me all night long. I didn't get much sleep to speak of. Perhaps you should go to a doctor, Alma. I did, Mr. Loris, yesterday. He said there was nothing wrong with me, but I know better. My head hurts something fierce all the time. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, ma'am. I'll show Mr. Harvey right in. Hello. Hello, Jim. Oh, Dolores, my dear, you look tired. How are you, Miss Jarvis? Very well, thank you. Well, Jim, I'm glad you stopped by. We've rather had the doldrums around here the past day or so. Yes, I know. I I thought I'd stop by now and be here for the funeral this afternoon. Poor Andrews. You loved him too, didn't you, Jim? Yes, dear. I guess I did. I've known Andrews almost as long as you have. Well, all I can say is I warned him again and again. If he'd only listen oh, to Andy, me. Oh, please. Jim... Let's go outside and get some air. I've been in the house all day. All right, dear. You would both better stay around close. I may need you. All right, Juana. We'll probably be in the garden very well. Oh, Jim. Yes? Remember about the lily pond? Oh, yes, of course I will. It's dangerous, you know. Be careful of it, Jim. Don't get too near to its edge. Yes, I'll remember Come, dear. Jim. Yes, dear? What did she mean about the lily pond? Hmm? Oh, oh, don't you remember that the railing around the pond was taken down for repairs? Hasn't been replaced yet. Yes, I know, but it's been down for almost a month. Here, let's walk on the grass, shall we? Why does she remind you about it now? Well... She probably doesn't want us to fall into it and soil our pretty clothes. But she seems so insistent. She said it's dangerous for you to be careful of it. For you not to go too near its edge. You, Jim, not me. Oh, she meant both of us, silly. She just addressed me because she wants me to take care of you. Does she? Why, of course she does. What do you mean? Jim... I've had the impression for a long time now that she doesn't want us to be married. Oh, nonsense. She's delighted. No, she's not delighted. But Dolores... I've wanted to tell you this for a long time. But I've, I've hesitated to say anything. I, I thought I might have been mistaken. Now I know it's true. She hates you, Jim. Juana hates me? <laughs> Why, of all the silly things I've ever heard of, Juana and I are great friends. Oh, darling, you're wrong. Juana has no love for you. I, I don't know why, but she'll be perfectly delighted if you and I never marry. Dolores. Jim, I want to be married just as soon as we possibly can. Then I want to go away from here. Away? Where, dear? I don't care where. Just so it's someplace else, anywhere but here. But, darling, I thought you loved this place. Love it? I despise it. Dolores. I do, Jim. Oh, darling, I'm so upset. There's something terrible going on around here. I, I don't know what it is. But it was responsible for Andrew's death. Darling, how can you say that? Because I know. You know what? There was nothing wrong with Andrew's eyes. What? No. Nothing at all wrong with them. But he went blind. The autopsy proved it. Well, that's why... I was... know. He died blind, yes. But I went with him to an optometrist about a week ago. 
Andrews had perfect vision in both eyes. And no sign of defect or weakness. But, Dolores, that's not possible. I know, but it happened. But how? How, dear? I can't answer that. Oh, Jim, look out. Good Lord. Oh, dear, it's the lily pool. You, you almost walked right into it. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was over farther to the east end of the garden. I, I don't know why we should be so frightened of it. It's quite shallow. Even if one of us did accidentally fall in, we, we'd only get a bit wet. Is that all that would happen? Jim, what do you mean? I wonder. Come on, dear. We must be getting back to the house. I want to brush up a bit before the crowd begins to drift in. Dolores, will you play the organ a while? I'd like some music. Do you mind if I don't, Auntie? I'm rather tired. Look here, Dolores. How about a swim down on the beach? The moon's up. It's quite warm tonight. Jim, I, I think I'd like that. Certainly, if you're too tired to play the organ, you're too tired to swim. Oh, it'll be good for her, Miss Jonas. She needs some fresh air and exercise. Yes, Auntie. You don't mind so much, do you? No, I suppose not. Good. Is there a suit in the men's quarters of the bathhouse I can use? Yes, yes. You'll find several there, James. Take your choice. Oh, fine. Come along, Dolores. No. Let's not go that way, Jim. Let's take the back door and cut through the garden to the bathhouse. All right, dear. We won't be long, Andy. Just a plunge and we'll be right back. Very well. Oh, James. Yes, Miss Jarvis? Remember about the lily pond? Oh, yes. Oh, all right. It's still quite dangerous, you know. Don't get too close to its edge. You may fall into it. Yes, all right. We'll be careful, Miss Jones. We can see it all right in the moonlight. Come on, Jim. There. You see? She keeps reminding you about the lily pond. Oh, well, that just proves she doesn't want anything to happen to me. I told you she doesn't dislike me. Jim, don't you think for a moment she doesn't. She dislikes you terribly. I think she even dislikes me. But why? Good heavens, Dolores. She took you in when you were a mere infant. Less than three years old. She's kept you. Clothes, a fine home, everything. Yes, I know. it. Till she... She hates me. Dolores, I don't understand. If you've known this all along, why didn't you say something to me about it? Because it's just recently she's changed. I... I don't know why she's changed. But she has. <sighs> Well, dear, suppose we forget everything for a while. This has been a trying day for all of us. Come on. I'll race you down to the bathhouse. Well, Jim must not be dressed yet. Odd. Plenty of time. Jim? Jim, do you hear me? Are you in the bathhouse, Jim? Jim? What's that over there? Surely it can... Oh, no. Jim? Jim? The little pond. It's head beneath the water. The lily stems around his throat. Oh, Jim. Jim, my darling, what happened to you, Jim? Please, try not to think about it. It's all over now, and there's nothing to be helped by thinking about it. But how did it ever happen to him? Dolores, you heard the coroner's verdict. Jim must have wandered over to the lily pond while waiting for you to finish dressing. He apparently stumbled and fell, striking his head on a rock, becoming unconscious. He fell with his head underwater, and it strangled him. Oh, it was so sudden. If I'd only been a little quicker dressing, I might have saved him. Don't think of that, dear. We can't help what's happened. Well, lie still, dear. I'll answer it. Hello? Yes, Mr. Evans? Yes? 
Very well. I'll, I'll come to your office right away. Yes, within the hour. Very well. Goodbye. Oh, Dolores, I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave you a while. That was my lawyer. And there's some very important papers I must attend to immediately. I'll be all right, Andy. I'll send Almain to take care of you. But I'm afraid she won't be of much help. She's been complaining of headache constantly. Night and day. Did you call me, Miss Dolores? Yes. Several times. You were so long answering. I'm I... sorry, Miss Dolores. I was downstairs. Can I do something for you, ma'am? Yes, Alma. I want the key to this room. That room, Miss Dolores? Yes. And I want it right away. My aunt has kept this room locked for 18 years. She's always told me she wants no one in there because her father died in that room. Yes, ma'am. That's it. Nothing else. I'm not so sure. I intend to go inside that room now. Get me the key. Oh, Miss Dolores, I beg you, ma'am. Don't go into that room. Whatever you do, ma'am, in the name of heaven, don't go into that room. Why not? Tell me, Alma, what's in there? It's frightful, ma'am. Please listen to me. My head's a splitting. I'm a sick woman. I'm almost a dead woman. But with the life that's left in me, I plead with you not to enter that room. Alma, stop this nonsense. It's not nonsense, miss. There's worse than the devil in there. Alma, do you have the key? Answer me. Do you have the key to that room? Yes, ma'am. That I have. I stole it from Miss Jarvis a month ago. Then let me have it. Give it to me. At once. I'll open the door. There you are, ma'am. I'll turn on the light. Why? Well, this room is empty. Nothing here but an old table covered with a huge black cloth. That's all, miss. Come now. Let's shut off the light and lock the door. No. Wait a minute. What's on that table? Please, Mr. Lawrence. Don't go near that table. I want to see. I ask you not to, Mr. Dolores. Dolls. Four little dolls, each about 12 inches tall, lying here on the table. Please come away, Mr. Dolores. Good heavens. This doll looks exactly like... like Andrew's. Look. Lying there on his back, with a common pin stuck squarely in the middle of each eye. He went blind, Mr. Dolores. Good heavens. An exact image of Jim Harvey, lying with his head submerged in a miniature lily pond. Mr. Harvey died in a lily pond, in the garden. This doll, Alma, it's an image of you, with a pin stuck into its head. Oh, Mr. Lars, ma'am, my head's killing me with its aching. Alma, this fourth doll. It's you, Mr. Lars. With another pin. Stuck into the doll's body, so it pierces the heart. Don't you feel pains in your heart, Miss Dolores? Alma, what in the world does all this mean? It's... it's witchcraft. Witchcraft? Black magic. But... I don't understand. It's Miss Jarnas, your aunt. First, she convinced Andrews he was going blind. Then, she convinced Mr. Harvey he'd die in the lily pond. And now... She's trying to kill me with a headache. And you with a heart attack. But how? How? They use it where she came from, miss. Where she came from years ago. Where was that? Haiti. Haiti? Yes. When you've got an enemy in Haiti, you want to get rid of him. You make a doll that looks like him. You put hair from his head on the doll's head. Cloth from his clothes for the doll's clothes. Then, you stick a pin in the part of the enemy you want to make hurt. 
And it works, Alma. It does, Miss Dolores. Look at Andrews. Blind because of the hex. Look at Mr. Harvey. Dead in the lily pond. Look at me. Me with my terrible headache. And the pin sticking in the head of that dog. We'll pull out the pin. Oh, no, don't. If you do that, I'm sure to die. Right away. Alma, tell me how you know all this. I've been listening, Miss Dolores. And watching. For years. I've been watching. And listening. And... Oh, Miss Dolores. Alma. Alma, what's wrong? Alma, speak to me. Are you all right? Alma. She's dead. There, Miss Dolores. You feeling better? Yes. Much. How... How did I get here in my bed, Doctor? Your aunt found you here. Unconscious. Then I did manage to get here before I fainted. Have... Have you found Alma? Yes. Poor girl. Dead. Brain hemorrhage. Brain hemorrhage? Yes. Where did you find her, Doctor? In her room. She must have died in her sleep. No. No, she didn't die in her bed. My aunt must have placed her there. Dolores, you know the truth. Do you, Dr. Seabrook? I've known it for years. I've been watching one of your aunt for years. When Andrews died, I became suspicious. When your fiancé perished in the lily pond, I was convinced. Convinced that Wanham was using her ancient jungle powers. Her what? Let me tell you a story. She was married to a wealthy plantation owner in Haiti about 18 years ago. One day, she decided to rid herself of him. So, she fed him poison. When he realized what she had done to him, he went off into the jungle to die. But first, he made a will leaving all his money and property to the baby daughter of his closest friend, a man who had died of jungle fever and whose baby had been taken to America by friends. While his husband left his fortune to that baby girl. That girl, my dear, was you. Before the poisoned man died... He sought out a jungle witch doctor and had him make a charm. It was a doll-like image of the woman who had poisoned him. He took a lock of her hair from where he'd always carried it in a gold locket, and the hair became the doll's hair. Then he took a long needle, dipped it in the most potent poison, and plunged that needle again and again into the body of the doll image. The poison was one that brings about instant and complete paralysis of the human muscles. Paralysis? Yes. It's a poison well known in Haiti. He... he cast a spell upon her, just as she's been casting spells on us. Precisely. But her spells were effective. His wasn't. No spell is effective... Unless the victim is made aware of its existence. Uh, Just a few moments ago, I told your aunt the same story I've told you. You mean you told her about the spell that was cast upon her years ago? In an offhand manner. I passed it on to her as just a story I'd heard from a friend of mine in Haiti. I pretended I didn't know that she was involved. Where is she now? You feel like getting up? Yes, yes, I'm all right. This door leads to your aunt's room, doesn't it? Yes, it's not locked. Here? It's she in here? Yes, she's in there. Oh... 
Oh, she's ill. Antoine, are you... Juana. Doctor, look at her. The spell she cast upon you is broken now. Your aunt is dead. But look at her. Yes. She died instantly of complete paralysis. You have heard Death is a Savage Deity, an original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop, based upon Mr. Bishop's own novel of the same title. Death is a Savage Deity included Eleanor Naylor Corrin as Dolores, Ben Morris, who was James Harvey, Georgiana Cook played Juana, Jesse Lee Fulton was Alma, and Fred Wayne was Dr. Seabrook. Next Friday at this same time, we will bring you another exciting and unusual tale of dark fantasy created by Scott Bishop. A weird adventure titled The Sea Phantom. The story of an ancient Spanish ghost ship. Dark fantasy originates in the studios of WKY Oklahoma City. Tom Paxton speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus. It's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Lights out for the devil and Mr. O. It is later than you think. Supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly so that if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O. Arch Obler. The world, as you know, is full of small people trying to be large and large people trying to be humble. You've met them at school, at work, in public office, or handing out licenses at City Hall. 
Well, I bring you a play now titled, by a coincidence, Big Mr. Little. And whether you're king of the hill at the moment, or at the bottom of the hill trying to scramble up, I think you'll remember Big Mr. Little. But that happens after a word from your announcer. In a sanctum mystery. Hello, this is your host, welcoming you through the squeaking door. Not for a half hour of terror, but to tell you about Radio Nostalgia magazine. Radio Nostalgia magazine is a must for old-time radio fans. It's the magazine with many photos and stories of old-time radio and its stars. Our current issue features a 16-page article on The Shadow. All subscribers will get a free Captain Midnight decoder badge, a Captain Midnight Flight Patrol membership, and a Flight Commander certificate from the Secret Squadron. To get your copy, send $1.50 in check or money order to Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, 07087. That's Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, Zip 07087. Send now and get a free 8x10 photo of the Lone Ranger in Tano, boys and girls. And now, if you haven't already done so, turn off your lights now and listen to Big Mr. Little. Hello, police department. Police department. My name is Charles Crager. Dr. Charles Craig. I live at 872 West Street, apartment 2B. I want you to come and get me. I have just killed a man, Jay Drogan. Did you hear me? I said, come and get me. I just killed a man. His name was... You sure as my name is Jay Drogan, I'm gonna drink this. Jay, forget it, will you? You better lie down and get some rest. Let me lie. Take your hands off me. I said I was gonna drink this mess, and I'm gonna drink it. Right out of the cocktail shaker. What are you doing? He's really drinking it. Holy cats, look at him. Oh, boy. Oh, that was terrific. How did it taste? Wonderful. I... I... Uh, Jay! He's sick! No, no, I, I'm all right. Hot in here. Window, want window open. The windows! Who broke all the windows? Oh, my head. Oh, what time? Nine. I've got to get up. Get to work. Oh. 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 Huh? All dressed. Bed in my clothes. Put me to bed. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh. Oh, all right, all right. All right. Hello, Jay Drogan speaking. Who? Oh, yeah. yeah. Hello, friend. Sure, sure, I'm coming down to the office. Party? All right, all right, a man. Got to have some fun once in a while, can't he? I got to wash up. I. All right, I'll be down here. Goodbye. <coughs> Son of a... Where's my hat? Well, what? Wind is broken. <laughs> some party. Uh, tell superintendent to get the windows fixed. Wonder what... Oh, well... Better get to the office. Good thing the building has an elevator. Couldn't walk downstairs. Uh, good morning there, Mr. Drogan. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Jensen. I was just... What the devil's the matter with this elevator? I've been punching this button for five minutes. Well, it takes time for it to come down when it's up on the top floor. It takes the time The devil for... with the time. It's always going wrong, that elevator. I wish that blasted thing would fall through the basement. Hey, it's falling... It, 
It fell. Just like you said. Oh, then, Drogan, sit down. Sit down. Thank you, Doctor. It was good of you to see me without an appointment. Well, you seem to be in quite a state. What is it? It's, uh, it's my head. You injured it? No, no, I, I don't think so. You see, I had a little party at my house last night. Oh, my head. Oh, <laughs> never mind, never mind. Well, this certainly is the morning after the night before. Go over to the window and let me look at you. Yes, Doctor. It's, it's my head, Doctor. Every sound... It's just the morning after. But every sound... That blasted airplane up there, it's so loud in my head, Doc. No, no, I... don't get excited. Why does that infernal pilot have to fly so low? Blast you up there, why don't you crack up? Look. He's falling. Falling. What you said, Drogan, really happened. Jordan, we, we better be moving on. Yeah. You come back to my office and I'll give you a sedative and you lie down and rest a little while and then you'll be all right. Yeah. Coincidence. That's nothing old. That's all it was. Nothing more. Well, watch out, man. Watch out where you're walking. It's okay. Mm. Now we can cross. Hey, you! How do you like that guy? Blasted cabs, they think they own the street. If I had my way, I'd smash them all up. Stop! Stop! It's happened again. Drink this. No, I tell you, drink this. I don't want to. It isn't what you want to do. It, it's a sedative. Now, drink it. Putting me to sleep for a little while is no now, help. Last night. Think about last night. Perhaps you... Well, drank something out of the ordinary. Well, why do you look at me like that? I... I did. What? Uh, that drink, I... I just remember. Tell me. But, but that couldn't be it. Tell me. Well, we got to kidding about who could mix the most unusual drinks, and I was feeling high, and I mixed one. Well, what was in the drink? I... I don't know. Well, you must know. If I knew what was in the drink, perhaps some chemical... Oh, wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? To the office. Well, what? Fred, my business. I, I've got this. No. You're completely out of your head. You're a menace, a walking danger. Don't you realize that you can't go out of here until we figure this out, some way to stop it? If you don't, every time you say a negative thought, it'll happen and someone will die. Do you want that? <laughs> What's the matter with you? Why should you laugh? Stop it. Stop it. Well, it's funny. I go to see my doctor because I'm going out of my head and he goes out of his head. But... What happened to you that all of a sudden you should... You said that I was a menace. When you said that, well, all at once, everything cleared up. What? Yeah. <laughs> me, a menace. That's the funniest thing anybody ever said about me. Look at me. No hair, half my teeth aren't my own. I've cut a pot belly and I'm a menace. <laughs> yeah, you, a doctor who's supposed to judge things only by facts, suddenly decide I'm a menace. Why? Because three screwy things happened that I had nothing to do with. And I had nothing to do with. Coincidences. Like getting four aces two times running, or rolling seven twenty-five times in a row, or anything else where two and two doesn't add up to four. That, that elevator would have fallen anyway, and, and that plane, so his mo motor cut out just when I said it. And, and the cabs, we were both so scared that we ran off without finding out whether or not there was a good reason why three cabs smashed up. Sure, cabs have accidents all the time. So, well, does that make me a menace? I ask you. Is that the way for a doctor to talk? Well, I'm sorry. Of course you're right. I've been talking like an emotional moron. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? I'm the man who has always evaluated situations through factual evidence. And even then, I've retained some measure of skepticism because I know how, well, how misleading human observation can be. Trogan. Would you mind shaking hands with a blasted fool? Sure, Doc. You're shaking hands with one, too. Uh, now, if you don't mind, can I use your telephone? Sure. Of course, of course. I've got to call my office, explain why I'm late. Oh, had me scared for a while. Hello. Hello, that you, Fred? 
Yeah. Yes, I'm on my way in. But I, I tell you, I'll be there in a few minutes. But I'm telling you. I know, I know, but I'm coming. Oh, stop yelling at me. Why didn't you drop dead? Fred. Hey, Fred. What's the matter? What's the matter? Why, I don't know. One minute I was talking to him, and then... Fred, Fred, answer me. No, it can't be. You're lying. Hello? Hello? Drogan. What is it? Tell me. Someone said Fred just dropped dead. We leave our The Devil and Mr. O story of Big Mr. Little to take a deep breath and a word from your station. Can you use $10,000 cash? Well, New Jersey homeowners can borrow up to $10,000 or even more. How? Your home is sure to be worth more today than when you bought it. The present resale value of your house, less the amount you owe on your mortgage, is your equity. And that equity gives you power. Power to borrow up to $10,000 or more through Provident Investment Corporation. You can use the money for a business investment, consolidation of debts, home improvements, purchase of a car, new furniture, college expenses, or even a wonderful vacation trip. And payments can be stretched out over many years, small enough to fit your budget. So if you are a New Jersey homeowner, call 488-3030 anytime, day or night. That's 488-3030. All information by phone, just one visit to our offices to pick up your check. So call 488-3030. That's 488-3030. And now back to our The Devil and Mr. O story of Big Mr. Little. What... What time is it, Doctor? One. I can't just sit here. No, no. You're, you're my responsibility. I, I've got to think something out. I, I just can't keep on not thinking anything. Great Godfrey... What? What's the matter with me? You can perform miracles. I'm convinced of that. All right. Then why in the name of common sense can't you perform positive miracles instead of negative ones? I, I don't understand. Listen to me. It, it's simple. It's so simple that neither one of us thought of it. Just as you can kill people and cause accidents, why can't you do good? Good? Heal the sick. Give eyes to the blind. But when it comes to killing... Kill the ones who should be killed. That's right. Maybe I could do that. No, wait a minute. It's all clear now. Every miracle that you performed today was a negative miracle. The falling elevator, the airplane, the taxis, your friend. Everything negative. You haven't performed a single positive miracle. Not a miracle for good instead of evil. Well, come with me. Where? Out into the street again. Come on, Drogan. We've got to find out if you can perform a good miracle just as easily as performing the other kind. And if you can, well, you'll start making history in a few minutes, Mr. Drogan. Now, Drogan, now. What? On the corner, the newsman. He's blind. Well, don't be stupid. We'll go over to him. Faber? Paper, get your paper. Hello, Tom. That you, doctor? Yes, give me a magazine. Well, anyone will do. Yes, sir. Wish it, Drogan. Wish that he could see. I am, I am. Hey, uh, doctor. How have you been? Oh, never mind about me. How about you? Huh? How about your eyes? <laughs> Are you kidding? Drogan, out loud. You've got to say it out loud. Hey, doc, what's the matter? Say it. I wish that he could see. Hey. Hey, what, what's going on here? Tom, you see. You do see. What's the matter with you, Doc? You can see. Let me alone, will you? What, what are you trying to do? What, what are you after? Can you see? Oh. Oh, I can't see. Get the devil away from here. I can't see. All right, Robin. Come on. Yeah. What does it mean? Whatever you want to do that's good doesn't happen. But whatever you say that's evil happens. God help you, Drogan. Well, 
Well, I know what you're doing. Just go in. Well, have a good sleep, friend Rogan? Yeah. What? Why did I fall asleep? I said it if I gave you. Oh. Drogan, I want you to meet my wife. How do you do? Well, well it's a pleasure, Mrs. Krieger. Yeah. Let me give you a hand. No, no, no. I'm all right. Yeah, of course. Uh, Drogan, I've told the entire story to my wife. She's clear-headed about this. I'll let her tell you what she thinks. Go ahead, Anne. Mr. Drogan, Charles thinks you're a menace to humanity. I don't think so. I think the danger to others is not through you, but through somebody else. You don't know what I mean. Well, that's understandable. I mean, you wouldn't willfully hurt anyone. But what if someone forced you to? What if your ability to perform miracles... Evil miracles? Yes, evil miracles, was discovered by some criminal... He would force you to do what he wanted, at no risk to himself, because since the criminal was performing an evil act, you couldn't hurt him. In other words, Drogan, someone could use you for criminal purposes. Yes, blackmail the world because you thought he could kill anyone in the world. You haven't said anything, Mr. Drogan. You do understand? Yes, I, I understand. What do you expect me to do about it? We don't expect you to do anything. The responsibility is beyond you or us. Whatever happens is up to the proper authorities. Uh, authorities? My wife means that what we must do is to tell the authorities of what happened. It's a wonderful idea. Trogan, I'm proud of you. A wonderful idea. Yeah, yes, of course, but why do you keep on saying that? You gave me a wonderful idea. But that's not important now. We've got to go to the authorities. All of us. No. Why should you say no? I, I'm not going anywhere. Neither are you. What? Charles, why should he say... Wait. No? What's the matter? Nothing. I'm not going any place, or you. What do you mean? Sit down. What the devil for? Sit down. No, I don't see what... Doctor, I'll let you talk. Now let me. Well, in my own way, I figured out the world. A long time ago. And that's why I was satisfied. Now, you see, it's like this. Some people are born with more than other people. One man has more brains, so he's an Einstein. Another fellow's born with good looks, so, so he's a movie star like that, that, that Taylor fellow. Another has muscles that work better, so he's a Joe Lewis. Another one's got more energy, so he's an Edison. Most people are born with just enough brains and muscles to get along in a plain, ordinary life, like me. I knew that. So, I was satisfied. Then, then this happened to me. All at once, all I've got to do is say something, and, and then it happens. Not good things, we found that out, but whatever I say that's wrong happens. I can do what anybody else in the world would like to do, we can't do. No army or navy or air force. I can say that somebody should die or, or that something should, should burn or break or fall, and it happens. At first, it was the same for me as for you, Doctor. I, I couldn't believe it was really so. Then, then while I was lying here, I heard you and your wife talking, and I began to figure things out. And then you both gave me the real idea. Dempsey and Joe Lewis and Tunney and those fellows who had better muscles made themselves millions. So did Edison and Ford and, and Chrysler and the rest of them who had brains. Now, I had something. Why shouldn't I get paid off, too? Paid off? That's right. How? Y you said it before. What? Uh, I think you call it blackmail. Charles! The way you both look at me, you'd think I'd said something you hadn't said before yourself. Anybody that's any good to the world, I can kill. All right. If people get paid off in this world for not letting other people starve, so I'll get paid off for not making people die. That's a pretty bad joke. Joke? No. Of course you're joking. No. You don't mean that. Sit down, Doctor. 
Doctor, I said for you to sit down. Don't you order me around. Now stop this nonsense and... Oh. I brought you some tea, Mrs. Crager. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Frederick. Just put the tray Wait down. a minute. Uh, take that tray out of here. Go ahead. Take it out. But I... I take orders only from Mrs. Crager. Is that so? Well, why don't you die? Frederick! He's dead, isn't he, Doctor? Yes. So you see, it isn't nonsense. You devil, you. Well, up to now, it's always been plain Sam. I never thought that you... That's just it. You should never underestimate a little man, now, now should you? Charles, do you hear me call the police? He hears you, but he won't do anything about it, will you? Charles, Doctor? don't just sit there. This man is a murderer. He killed Doctor, Frederick. Doctor, your you wife is talking a little too much, Why isn't she? Why you won't you please Doctor, do you hear me? I suggest you tell your wife to shut her mouth. Charles, Or maybe you'd like me to say something to her. The words I said about the servant. you, call the Suppose I said, Mrs. Crager, I wish you... Stop. Will you please do something about And stop it. Stop. You hear me? Stop it. Now, it'll be all right, dear. It'll be all right. Of course it will. As long as we're sensible about this. Now then, what is my plan? Oh, very simply this. You and your wife are going to help me get everything in the world that I want. Yes, everything. What I tell you to do, you will do. Um, uh, letters. I, I will decide on three influential gentlemen in our government... And three wealthy gentlemen in industry to whom you will send letters explaining about me. Now, they won't believe, but at the time I tell them to, they'll die, and the newspapers will know about it. And after that, everyone will believe me, now, won't they? And so as not to die, everyone will do exactly as I want, won't they? Because they won't have any choice in the matter. If they send soldiers against me, I'll wish that they'll be dead, and, and they will be dead. And soon, from Washington to London to Moscow, everyone will be doing exactly what Sam Drogan wants them to do. And that'll be wonderful, won't it? All the good people of the world doing exactly what one little man wants them to do. Well, you haven't said anything, Doctor. You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes. It was inevitable. Of course, I, I won't want you and your wife to leave here. Now then, we, we'd better have this man's body removed, and then we'd better get to work. Or have you any suggestions? Do you mind if I have a drink? Drink? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. A drink started all this, didn't it? <laughs> Go right ahead, Doctor. Thank you. A and you, Mrs. Crager, you're quite all right now, aren't you? Yes, I'm sure you are, the way you sit there looking at me. You and your husband will do exactly as I say, because you're both good people, and... I'm deaf to good people, and you know that now, don't you? Yes, I'm sure my wife knows that. Your drink. Oh, yes. Oh, and quite a full one. Thank you, Doctor. I, uh, I drink to, to your continued good health. <clears throat> well, a strong one and a good one. Thank you, Doctor. I, uh, I... What? Drink? Oh, my throat, you... You put... No. Wouldn't dare. I'll... Kill... Charles, what did you... Kill... He... Kill... Charles, he's going to... Wait. Oh, I wish... You... Charles! Both... Whoa. Charles, you killed. Yes. Poison worked more slowly than should have, but it worked. Drogan, you made one mistake. You should never underestimate what good people can do. If they have to. This is Mr. O, Arch Obler. Let me tell you about next week's package of thrills and chills and blood and ideas. It's a story about, uh, but more of that after a word from your station. That's what gambling's all about. 
Some things no sensible person gambles with is his life. Every year, thousands of Americans die because they haven't learned the warning signs of heart attack. Learn these facts. The usual warning signs of heart attack are prolonged heavy pressure or squeezing pain in the center of the chest behind the breastbone. The pain may spread to the shoulder, the arm, the neck, or the jaw. Sweating may occur, nausea, vomiting, or shortness of breath. If you or anyone you know experience these symptoms, call the doctor at once. If you can't reach him, get to the emergency room of the nearest hospital. For more information on the warning signs of heart attack, get in touch with your heart association. A public service announcement from the Essex County Heart Association and WVNJ. This is Mr. O again. Revenge. It's a very dynamic word. When one is young, one is full of, quote, getting even, unquote. But as one grows more mature, one discovers that revenge is a very empty bubble. Unless, like the character in my next week's play, No Escape, that revenge reaches into the graveyard. someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Adventures in time and space, transcribed in future tense. Dimension X. This is a story of Riesling, the singer of the spaceways. You've probably sung his songs in school, in English, French, or German. The language doesn't matter, but it was an earth tongue. But the real story of Riesling is not found in the footnotes of a scholar's critique or a publisher's biography. It is in the memories of the old-time spacemen, the pioneers who pushed the thundering old-fashioned rockets to the far strange ports that are our commonplace heritage. These men know the true story of Riesling. The arching sky is calling spacemen back to their trade. All hands stand by free, falling and the light below us fade. Out ride the sons of terror, far drives the thundering jet, up leaps the race of I 
last met Riesling, he was hustling drinks in the Twin Moons Bar at Drywater, Mars. He'd won a guitar off a Chinese barkeep at Luna City by cheating at one thumb, and he made his whiskey by singing in the bar and passing the hand. Listen to her, Hudson. Don't she strum pretty? Like a 16-year-old gal. Say, how much did you collect on that last song? Three dollars, Marshal, and a slug. Al grabbed it from a bill. You don't trust me no more. Funny, never did have no luck with hound dogs nor Martian barking. Hey, Riesling, look over there by the bar. There's an Institute Four Striper giving it the eye. Know him? <laughs> Captain Hicks off the goshawk. Are you sure giving you the once over? <laughs> Maybe he's got a job. <laughs> <laughs> they don't make never no mind to me. I've been blacklisted. Hicks logged me for making up a song on watch. Right fine song, too. Uh, hold it. Here comes the brass arm. Uh, Riesling, uh, I've been looking for you. I've been right here, Skipper. You saw of that. I need a jet man on the goshawk. Interesting. Real interesting. Well? I got news for you, Skipper. You blacklisted me, remember? Well, you kept your nose clean, and uh, we need an experienced man. Been a little changing down aft in the goshawk, ain't there, Skipper? How'd you know that? You got that new atomic pile drive. Last three of them tea kettles <laughs> blew somewhere in the asteroids. Look, it's double pay, but if you're scared... Scared? Listen, fella. But double pay, I'd jump off the top of the Harriman Tower if you allowed me rubber heels for the landing. All right, then. You show up tonight to sign the book. Sober. Got no choice, Skipper. Money and me is total strangers. We lift at 11.30 Mars time. Sober, you understand, Riesling? <laughs> you taking the job? Well, that goshawk is one stinking old tub. Her engine's got more bugs than a beagle dog in spring. And that new drive is about as safe as a pretty gal in the Ozone. But I reckon she'll do for one more trip. Ah. Welcome home, Riesling. Hi, Jimmy Licks. Meet my friend Hertzman. He's signing on as a waffle. Wiper. This is Jimmy Legs Casey. <laughs> He's boatswain. Can't hold his liquor no more than a sieve, poor boy. <laughs> you see, you uh, sober enough to sign the book? Drunk or sober, I make my mark. Stand aside. Uh, three X's. <laughs> Took me a middle name. <laughs> yeah, you two lay below. And Hertzman. Aye, right, sir. Get him sobered up before the skipper makes rounds. Jimmy Legs, I'm sober as a hanging judge. Yeah? Well, you can leave that bottle here. What bottle? The one in your back pocket. Oh, glass buttons, maybe, huh? <laughs> Give it here. Jimmy Legs, I swear I'm going to write a song about you. Go ahead, threaten me. Now, get below. We raise ship in 30 minutes. Skipper? Riesling, what the devil are you doing up here on the bridge without permission? Figured I'd take a little stroll. Riesling, get below no, before no, no, I have... Hold on, Skipper. You'll have that gold braid just crawling up your arm. I'm up here on business. Well? That number two jet ain't fit. Cadmium dampers are warped. Why tell me? Tell the chief engineer. I did. He says they'll hold. Well? He's wrong. He's wrong. He's got a Harriman Institute degree in power electronics. And some drunk space rat says he's wrong. Skipper, I was damping jets when that shirt tail tad wore pins for buttons. I've got no time for you, Riesling. Casey, sound take off. Hi, sir. I'm telling you, Skipper, that number two jet's gonna blow. Dampers warm crooked like a turtle's back. Riesling, drag your dead head out of here. Get below. Go ahead from the control tower, Captain. All right, Casey. Fire one and four. <laughs> for three watches before going into free flight. Riesling and I had the second watch. Damping was done by hand in those days with a multiplying vernier and a danger peeper. And as long as the peeper ticked off slow and steady, we knew the ship was safe for a while. Hey, Riesling, you better stow that guitar. If Jimmy Legs catches it, he'll blow a gasket. Don't worry, I can damp this tea kettle in my sleep. How's number two? Uh, all right, so far. Did you ever hear that song about Hicks, the one that got me blacklisted? 
Oh, the skipper is the father of his crew. A gentle guiding light to me and you. But on Mars he likes his women if they walk or if they're swimming or if they've got six arms instead of two. <laughs> hey, the, the second verse is better. Now the skipper likes his liquor by the quart. Yes, he go from Mars to Venus for a snort. He'll drink rocket fuel and... Well, hi, Skip. Didn't see you come in. You were too busy, eh? Who's watching the gauge? I got an eye on it. Don't you fret none. Riesling, I'm going to fix it so you can't get a berth on a rocket-powered pogo stick. Report to Casey under arrest. I don't rightly think I will. You what? You kind of forget, Skipper. According to space code, you can't remove a jetman till the end of the watch. Right? Now look, you corn-fed space lawyer. Now, is that a rule or ain't it? Riesling, your ship is over at 2300. And I'll see you ride the rest of the way in slop locker. Maybe. Maybe. In the meantime, you clear out of my power room. I gotta make me up a third verse for my song. I got it. Power room. Damn, number two a point. Number two, all right. Hey, let me have that mic. Jimmy Legs, is that force drive boil up there? Give me that, Casey. Riesling. I've taken just about enough from and you. And I've got a little news for you, Skipper. Number two jet is bulging like a fat lady in a satin skirt. Listen, you clown. That's Skipper, it. I think I'm going to junk my song and start over. I could do much better this on you. This is the last time, Wesley. Damn number two, a point. Why, uh, sure. Look out, Hurt. I'll take it. You watch the gauge. Now. She's bucking a little. Riesling, get the emergency. Ah, she won't dip. Get that boy. There go the lights. Riesling, Riesling, stay down behind the bag. I've got to take a look. It's radioactive. Look out. I've got to piece the hot stuff up the tube. What's going on down there? Shut up, Jimmy. She's tight now. What happened? Number two blew your lunk-headed space rat. You all right? A uh, little sunburn. Uh, the lights are gone. Hey, what's the matter with the emergency circuits? Riesling. Jimmy Legs, get some lights down here. It's dark. Get the emergency light on. They're on, Riesling. They went on after the blast. The lights are on. What are you talking about? Jimmy Legs. Jimmy Legs, turn on the lights. It's dark. Turn on the lights. That blue radioactive glow from the jets was the last thing Riesling ever saw. His optic nerve was burned out in an instant. He was in sick bay on the rest of the trip, and on the swing back, we set Riesling down at dry water Mars. Look out for the cable, Riesling. Thanks, Richard. Hey, Riesling. That you, Jimmy Legs? Hold up a minute, will you? Oh, uh, Riesling. Jimmy Legs, I promised I'd write a song about you, didn't I? <laughs> sure, Riesling, sure. Can't seem to sing like I used to. Hey, look, Riesling, uh, the men up on the bridge feel kind of bad about this. Yeah? Why didn't they think of that when Riesling told them that damper was shot? Now, Hertzman, that's all over. Sure, sure, that's all forgotten. Riesling, let's, let's get out of the Twin Moons before I vomit. Now, hold it, hold it. The skipper feels pretty bad about the whole thing, Riesling. Kind of late for that, Jimmy Lakes. Feeling sorry, don't hold no corn. The boys passed the hat. The skipper kicked in half a month's pay. Did he now? Then on principle, I suppose I ought to tell him to stuff it back up the jets. But you can't buy no drinking whiskey on principle. I'll take it. Here you are. Uh, I'll get it. Uh, I'll be seeing you recently. Sure, Jimmy Lee. Sure. Come on, Hertzman. Let's get that drink. That was all. Just another space bum who didn't have the good sense to finish before his luck ran out. 
I knew Riesling holed up at the Twin Moons till his money was gone. Then he hooked a ride on a crawler over to Marsopolis. It was a boom town then, with an industrial district mushrooming between the Lesser and Grand Canal. I ran into Riesling about two months later, playing his guitar on a jetty that ran out into the canal. He had a dirty rag tied over his eyes with a jetman's knot, and his hat was on the wharf beside him. Who's that? Wait a minute. Kurtzman. Yeah, how have you been? Passable. Gee, is this a Venusian dime? Ah, it's a slug. <laughs> I figured. Well, how's it going? Singing again? Some. Work in saloons, mostly. But I've been thinking some funny songs, Hertzman. The words come out different than they used to. Come on along the canal with me. Sure. Uh, here, take my arm. I know the way. That's a funny thing, Hertzman. I figure I know it better than other folks. Look back there, t- towards the city. What do you see? Factory towers. Ah, smell them from here. But it don't seem that way to me. I remember them old buildings. Old before Bible times on earth. Thin and graceful like the fairy palaces my grandma used to tell about down home in the hills. Well, they've torn them down now. Or else blocked them up with cinder bricks. Hertzman... When I stand out out here on the canal, I can see it the way it used to be. The water, ice blue with the stars shining up out of it. Way off there, the city with the towers sweeping up like a bird of flying off a tree. I can see it. It's the dirtiest stinkhole in the system. Not always. Depends on how you see it. Won't I the race that raised the towers? Forgotten are their lords. Long gone the gods who shed the tears that lap these crystal shores. Slow beats the time worn heart of Mars beneath. Why don't you go home, Riesling? Home? Earth. I've been thinking about that, Hertzman. When I was a youngster down in the Ozarks, I used to climb a big old oak tree my daddy had in the dooryard. You could see the hills for miles, green and cool. I've been thinking about that. Why don't you go back then? I couldn't see them hills no more now. I couldn't stand to see black when I knew they was lying all around me, cool and green in the sun. I couldn't stand that. Yeah. Well, let's get back to town, Hertzman. Today I made three and a half dollars mush, and I'm all set to drink it down before dawn. Come on! I lost track of Riesling after that. I shipped out on a slow freight to the Condor class for Luna, and he hitchhiked a ride to Venusburg on an ore ship in the Triplanet run. And so he beat around the system, Venusburg to Layport to Drywater to New Shanghai and back. Any spaceport was his home, and no skipper had refused to lift the extra mass of Riesling and his battered guitar. He made up his songs, sitting out watches down in the power room with old shipmates, while the monotonous beat of the jet shook the hull plates. Hear the jet, hear the jet. Hear them snarl at your back when you're stretched on the rack. Hear the jet. Feel the pain in your ship. Feel the strain in your grip. Hear the jet. Feel her rise, feel her drive. Strand steel come alive on her jet. Little by little, his songs began to travel along the spaceways ahead of him. Raw spaceman songs with titles like... Since the pusher met my cousin, and the space is built for two. But more and more, we began to hear a different kind of song. Strange, sad songs, 
the ones you find printed in the centennial editions. Dark star passing. Death song of a woods cove. And then, finally, the green hills of Earth. It grew for 20 years, that song. They say it started way back when Riesling was down in the labor camps on Venus, singing for the indentured man. Now, if someone will kindly pass a bottle. It is not much, Riesling. Here. It'll do. <laughs> yeah, what is that stuff? Tequila. You cannot make him good here on Venus. What do you use? Karak bush. A home it is... Oh, it is different. Where are you from, son? Tasco, Mexico. That's a long way from here. See, si, a long way. <laughs> How'd you come to sign on? The man comes out of the village from the city in the shining automobile. Very big. He says there is work. You sign the paper for ten years and you work. Yeah, work. There is work here, all right. Ten stinking hours in the jungle with machete. I tell you, when I get home to Earth... What will you do, son? Ah, what is the use? We aren't getting home. You know how many men die out there in the swamp today? Ten men, ten! What is the use? My mother, she's dead. My father don't care. A girl? Oh, she, she says she wait. I, I don't know. Sure, son. <laughs> You, uh, you sing some more, Easton. We drink, you sing. Maybe a new song, son. We ride in the molds of Venus. We regurgitated breath. Foul are her flooded jungles are crawling with unclean bed. Let the... What is the matter? Finish the song, Riesling. I can't. Can't yet. It just don't come. I'll finish it when I go home. That's it. When I go home to the hills. Now pass that bottle. Uh, the dawn whistle don't blow for four hours. <laughs> That's where the Green Hill started. And I was there when it was finished. It was 20 years after that. And there wasn't a man flying around the beach hadn't heard of Riesling and his songs. He was getting old now for a spaceman. He was a familiar figure through the whole system. Tall, gaunt, and with that dirty bandage tied across his blind eyes. I was chief jetman then on the old Falcon. We were cradled at Venus Alice Isle, scheduled for a direct jump to Great Lakes, Illinois, on Earth. I was checking in Dunnage when Riesling felt his way up the gangway and came through the lock. Riesling! Who's that? Mike Hertzman. Hertzman? Hertzman. Well, what are you doing on this old hog? I figured I'd ride her back to Earth. Earth? Are you going home, Riesling? I thought you were never going to make that run. I've been hankering to set foot in the Ozarks again. How about those hills? I've been singing about them so long now, Hertzman. I, I got to finish the song. I gotta set foot in the dooryard and hear the wind through that oak tree. About the last thing I'll be doing, I gotta get home before. It... Riesling, there's a new company policy. In you see, now. Hertzman, I'm getting just a little old. Riesling, listen. No more deadhead rides. The new code book is in force. Oh, I seen code books come and go. The skipper's one of them youngsters fresh out of Harriman Institute cadet training. He's liable to throw the book at you. At me? I've been around space as long as Halley's Comet and Brewster's Ridge. I'm going back to Earth, the cool green hills of Earth. I'm going home. All secured, Hertzman. What are you doing here? That's Riesling, Captain. Riesling, huh? I'm dragging it back to Earth, Captain. Not in this ship. Hertzman have his man removed. Funny thing, Captain, I... I was sprained my shoulder sudden. Look, Skipper, you're a youngster. You're, you're pretty new out here. I'm going home. You don't know what that means to an old man going home. I can't take you. Against the Harriman Code. Oh, now look, Skipper. You can slide me by to the distressed spaceman's clause in that code book. Distressed spaceman, my eye. You've been bumming around the system for 30 years. Skipper. You make me do something I've never done for no one before. I'm an old man. An old blind man, and I want to go home. I ain't never crawled in front of a four-striper in my life, but... You gotta let me drag home. The law says a man's got a trip coming to him. 
You you can stretch for a poor old blind man, now can't you? You got it, Skipper. All right, you old space rat. But keep out of the way. I run an efficient ship, and I don't want any trouble. No, sir. No, sir. No trouble. I'll just lay down to the power room. I kind of like to be near the jets when they blast off. For Earth. Sit down, Riesling. Take a load off your feet. Thanks, man. Stand by for left. Stand by. Best seat in the system. Power room and an old hawk glass ship. Power room, fire three. I see. And the cool green hills of Earth. Still singing that recently? Oh, some. I changed her a little. Gonna finish her now, Mac. Going home to finish her. Yeah. Have you seen those new uh, automatic dampers, Riesling? Don't have to do nothing but sit and watch. Uh, where, where's the peeper? Turned off. She's all automatic. Uh, you have it soft nowadays. When I was twisting her tail, you had to stay awake. You got an old hand damping plates on? All but the links. I unship them. They cover up the dials. You might need them. No, the automatic's handled. Finally going home, Riesling, huh? Won't seem the same out past the moon. I've been waiting for this a long time, Mac. Gonna be good to get home, I reckon. The arching sky is calling spacemen back. Mac! Mac, Mac, you all right? I, I, I got the emergency. The hand dampers, where are the links? Mac, Mac, you'll be on the wall here something. I, I, I got it. Power room, what's the alarm? Emergency squad coming in. Stay out, the place is hot. Radiation blast. Stay behind the baffle. I got the link shift. I, I can hand damper now. What's going on in there? I'm still in jet three. Is this McDougal? McDougal is dead. This is Riesling on watch. Riesling, get out of there. You'll kill yourself. Don't worry, Skipper. I know this power room. I can inside of my shirt. Somebody's got a damper. Riesling, I'm sending in a crew. No, 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 no use. The whole room will be hot for an hour and the other jets won't hold. Skipper, throw on the recording tape. What? Throw on the recording tape. I want to get something down. Tape's on, Riesling. Stop it, Riesling. The radiation will burn you down. Yeah, I reckon. Yeah, pretty soft sunburn. Pick me out of here with a dog. Bury me in a lead shield coffin. Uh, okay, Skip. She's clean. Uh, radiation's getting brighter. I can almost see bright, rosy like the sun. Like the sun over the hills down home. I got my song figured right now. Here it comes. We pray for one last landing on the globe that gave us birth. Let us rest our eyes on the fleecy skies of the cool green hills of Earth. I can see him now. He's huge. My son. I can see the sun. That's the way he died. Riesling, the blind singer of the spaceways, singing of the home he never reached, the cool green hills of Earth. time next week for another adventure into the unknown world of Dimension X. The chilling true terror of the black-eyed kids, a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. The Black Eyed Kids are an urban legend of vast proportions. The stories of small children turning up on people's doorsteps all across the world, spreading fear and terror, have only increased over time. This compilation of G. Michael Vasey's books on this scary phenomena 
include new material and new true stories as well as the complete texts of The Black-Eyed Demons Are Coming and The Black-Eyed Kids. Supernatural expert G. Michael Vasey carefully investigates this truly terrifying phenomenon using real-life encounters with these scary supernatural beings. The result is an unsettling and sometimes terrifying book that'll have you fearfully anticipating that knock at your door late at night. Who and what are these mysterious visitors to the doorstep? Are they demons? Aliens? What do they want? Why do they need to enter your home? And what happens if they do? Small kids that ask to use your phone or for a ride, and yet those who encounter them are scared to death even before they notice their black eyes. The Chilling True Terror of the Black-Eyed Kids a monster compilation by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Quick, Rennie, use your fists. Knock down that door. Here it goes. Ah! Look! Holy cow! He's hanging by his neck from the rafters. Here comes Monk Mayfair, the eighth white chemist. Blazes! Ham Brooks, the sword-wielding lawyer. Take that! Rennie Renwick, the two-fisted engineer. Holy cow! Long Tom Roberts, the adventurous electrical genius. Pipe down, you guys. Johnny Littlejohn, the fighting archaeologist. Now be super amalgamated. And their leader, the greatest adventure hero of the 1930s, the Man of Bronze, Doc Savage. The Variety Arts Radio Theater, by special arrangement with Condé Nast Publications, presents The Adventures of Doc Savage, a new series of radio adventures based on the novels by Lester Dent. Today, The Hanging Man, Chapter 2 of the fantastic story, Fear Key. A crooked lawyer named Hallett has attempted to kidnap Doc Savage, but the man of bronze turns the table on the lawyer and his henchmen and learns that they have been hired by a mysterious company called Fountain of Youth Incorporated to keep Doc and his five aides out of the way for two weeks. While on their way to investigate the offices of Fountain of Youth, Doc, Monk Mayfair, and Ham Brooks are shot at by the company's president, a man named Santini. Inside the offices, Doc discovers that Santini has sent Hallett and his crooks to waylay one Kel Avery, who is supposedly on a plane bound for New York. He also discovers a secret file containing the names of the wealthiest men in America. Just then, a mysterious phone call interrupts their search, and an unknown voice declares that Kel Avery is not on the New York plane. Who was that, Doc? It was the strangest voice, Monk, indescribably young and joyful. What did he say? He seemed to know all about this business, Ham. And he said that Kel Avery is not on that plane bound for New York. So, where is Kel Avery? At 1120 Fish Lane, he said. Fish Lane? That's out in Flushing Marshes. That neighborhood ain't so hot, Doc. Yes, Monk, I know. Who are you calling, Doc? Our offices. Johnny Rennie and Long Tom are there, and I have a job for them. Oh, 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 boy! Everybody's getting into the act. Things will start brewing now. Yes? Johnny? Undeniably, Doc. Monk and Ham told you of the plot to abduct me? Oh, uh, completely. The perpetrators have been suitably chastised, I assume. Yes, but they got away. How unfortunate. Perhaps not. In any case, we have reason to believe they are going to try the same thing on someone named Kel Avery, who may be at 1120 Fish Lane. You and Rennie and Long Tom head there and investigate. Monk and Ham and I will be here another 10 or 15 minutes. Will you join us at this piscatorial thoroughfare later? Yes, we will. 
Uh, exactly what are your present whereabouts? Queen Tower Building, room 1402. Excellent. Why? <laughs> are you going to get a surprise? <laughs> Was that Johnny I heard laughing, Doc? Yes. Strange. Johnny doesn't go in for such playful mysteries as a usual thing. <laughs> Maybe using all them big words like he does finally made him dizzy. Perhaps. In any case, let's continue going through these files. Yes, a cabinet full of files on the wealthiest men in America bears further scrutiny. Especially when I got all the details about their health in them, too. Hmm. Here's one that's quite dog-eared with thumbprints all over it, as though it's been used more often than the others. Ham, take a look at this. Hmm. Thackeray Hutchinson. Name rings a bell. Heard of him? Yes, now I remember. Thackeray Hutchinson is one of the wealthiest bankers in the country. The government once tried to convict him on the legal practices in connection with the public utilities project, but a battery of clever lawyers got him off. Well, we'll investigate him more thoroughly later. I think we found all we can here. Let's go. <laughs> Shall I get a cab, Doc? I don't think that'll be necessary, Monk. Look there. Hey, how'd your roads to get parked at the curb? I'd say it was delivered by that lovely vision in bronze standing next to it, no doubt. Pat! Hey, Doc, it's your cousin. Hey, Pat! Pat Savage! Hello, Monk, Ham. Hiya, Doc. I say, Pat, with that bronze hair, smart frock, and chic hat, you sure make the other New York women look rusty. Yeah, you sure inherited all this Savage family looks, Pat. But I thought you was up in the North Woods shooting polar bears or something. Well, I got tired of the woods. Too tame. I decided I needed some adventure. So, I headed back for New York to hook up with Doc and his five assistants again. Johnny told me I could catch you here if I hurried. So that's what Johnny was laughing about. We'll talk on the way uptown, Pat, but I'm afraid we'll have to drop you at the office until we get a, a matter settled. Oh, a matter? Sounds interesting. It's a plot up with Pat, or rather some other cookies are plotting something. Well, I'm going along. It's dangerous, or maybe... Oh, Doc, Pat's as good a scrapper as any of us, except maybe you. She certainly held her own in our skirmish with the phantom werewolves last year. And having a golden-eyed bit of bronze loveliness along won't hurt none either. All right, she can come along. Great. It'll be like old times having you back with us, Pat. <laughs> the love of hunting trouble must run in the savage blood. Gentlemen, I yearn for some action. Well, here it is. It's a team. And then two birds howl at Leaky. And about ten other hoods. Into the car, quick. Doc said to come, wasn't it, Johnny? Eminently correct, Rennie. Well, this is it, but it ain't nothing but an unpaved rut founded by wooden tar paper shacks. Long Tom, what was the address again? 1120. That's where this Calavery is supposed to be. There it is, over there. That joint sure ain't much. Shingles scabbing off the roof. Tin cans nailed over knot holes, old clothes wadded in place of missing window. We needn't wait on Doc for this. All we have to do is ascertain whether this Kel Avery is in attendance. Let's take it. I agree. Say, look. What? Here in the mud by the stoop. Footprints. Seems to have been only one guy walking in and out of here. A logical assumption. Judging from the minuscule dimensions of the depression, although a person of male gender is not necessarily indicated. Oh, Johnny said you're right, but it could have also been a girl. Oh, yeah. Let's go inside. An absence of response. Take a look through the keyhole, Johnny. I'll be super amalgamated. What, what is, is it? it? Let's get inside, fast! How come it's only when there's action that you speak in one-syllable words, Johnny? Stand back. Franny, it never fails to amaze me how you can destroy virtually any door with one blow. Oh, uh, this one was nothing. Only two inches thick. Inside. Look, 
Somebody hanging by his neck from the rafters. Revolting. Horrible. Damn bad. How long's he been hanging there, do you suppose? Well, if the ceiling weren't gone and the attic exposed, he never could have gotten the heights enough to do it. Well, he got enough. Look at that long white beard. Almost without any color at all. Like like it'd been bleached. It, it just looks that way because his face is so purple from the throttling effect. Oh, I don't know. He looks really old. Come on, you guys. Get him down. He may still be alive. Uh, better keep your hands in sack, gentlemen. Holy cow. Yeah, I'll say he's alive. Just stand where you are till I get out of this noose. Now, just stand still. I'm going to search your pockets. Take it easy, fellas. This guy really took us in. Now, what have we here? Funny-looking handguns. Careful of those old-timers. They may look like handguns, but they shoot like machine guns. And they have hair triggers. Well, no matter what they are, you won't be needing them. Oh, no, you don't. Benny, don't. Ah! Wow. I haven't seen a speedier move than that, even from Doc himself. Why didn't Santini, Hallett, and Leaking come instead of sending you gentlemen? Are you Kel Avery? <laughs> are you trying to kid me? I said, are you Kel Avery? No, sir. And you should know that, being in Santini's gang. Well, how wrong, Whiskers. We're not working for a Santini. Save that guff, sir. And don't believe you can talk fast enough to fool old Dan Thunden. Dan Thunden? That your name? <laughs> As if Santini hadn't told you. I tell you, we're not with... Shut up! Sir, would you condescend to answer a simple interrogation from me? What's your question? How old are you? One hundred and thirty-one years. Oh, that's a dang lie. Nobody could be as spry as you are at that age. I agree. Ah, what? Your hands up, sir. I don't think so. <laughs> That's all right, Pat. I have a feeling we'll see Dan Thunden again before this business is over. <laughs> and what a business. I've only been with you half an hour, and I've already been in two fights. Two fights? Take a look at Doc Sedan. Santini, Helen, Leaking, and their gang jumped us. They stopped our car by blocking the street with a taxi and ran out with guns and cut loose. Holy cow. I aged ten years wondering if Doc Sedan really was bulletproof. And was it a good feeling when those bullets bounced off? What about Santini's gang? Well, they had cars set for a fast getaway. They were gone before we could get straightened out and follow them. You're an awful bad company, Cass. <laughs> I love this company. <laughs> There it is in the shipping record. Let's see. Ah, oh, see the thing. Oh, yeah. The schooner sea nymph sailed from New York in 1843. According to a manifest, the skipper was a man bearing the name Dan Thunder, who age at that time was exactly 40. Computation would indicate that Captain Dan Thunder of the Sea Nymph would be 131 years of age if he'd lived to this day. <laughs> Nuts. To whom are you attributing the qualities of a hard-shelled fruit? Not to you, Johnny, but it's silly to think that any guy 131 years old could be as spry as that old white-whiskered gent we saw in Fish Lane. Holy cow. What now, Rennie? The shipping records go on to say that the voyage in 1843 was the sea nymph's last. She was lost at sea and never heard from again. 
We have about an hour to spare before heading for the airport to meet this Kel Avery, who was ordered seized by Santini. You think they'll go through with the attempted capture, Doc? Why not? They don't know we intercepted Santini's orders to Hallett and Leaking. That's right. Well, what about the hour we have to spare? How about some dinner? I think we'd be better advised to learn what this is all about. Don't you guys ever eat? <laughs> Not when there's danger to be met. How are we going to find out about what this is all about, Doc? Recall the file of wealthy men in the offices of Fountain of Youth? Yeah. One of the files seemed to be more used than the others. Remember the name, Ham? Thackeray Hutchinson. Correct. Ooh, are we going to ask this Thackeray Hutchinson a few questions? Yes, Monk. We are. <laughs> Diggs. He has the entire top floor penthouse, I hear. I never did like this Hutchinson. He's an orphan robber. A successful orphan robber, Ham, if this domicile is any indication. May I help you? You're the butler? I am. I'm Doc Savage. We're here to see Mr. Thackeray Hutchinson. Uh, Mr. Hutchinson is not in. Don't lie to us. In the library. What is this? Damn you, get out of here. My name is Savage, Mr. Hutchinson. We've come to call upon you. I know you're Doc Savage. And some fools think you're a big shot. You may buffalo some people, but you won't get to first base with me. Now, get out. We've called on you to learn what you know of the Fountain of Youth Incorporated. Never heard of it. That is not true. If you don't get out of here, I'll call the police. The police are here, Mr. Hutchinson. Where? We are the police. Each of my men and myself holds a commission in the New York Police Force. Here are my credentials. Mr. Hutchinson, you are under arrest. Oh, what? The Fountain of Youth Incorporated has made repeated attempts to kill me within the last two hours. You may be connected with the concern. That means a trip to jail. You, you're crazy! An accessory to murder or attempted murder is a criminal charge, and all your money won't keep you out of prison. Oh, what do you want to know? I'll tell you. That's better. Now, Mr. Hutchinson, what is your connection with Fountain of Youth, Incorporated? I don't know. I'm only a customer. Customer? Oh, this is horrible. If only Fountain of Youth hadn't gotten into trouble. They had the secret, and now they've got in trouble, and it'll be lost. Go on. I was to pay them a million dollars for the secret. It was cheap at the price. A select list of other rich men was to receive the secret, too. We've been selected carefully because of our wealth and... Uh, other qualifications. Wait. This isn't making sense. What is this secret for which you and other wealthy men were willing to pay a million each? They've got a man here. They said they had to be sure we didn't tell the secret or plot against them to get the weeds. Fountain of Youth has a man here? One of Santini's gang? Yes. Who is he? Spill your insides, will you? Oh. Oh. He's one of Santini's men. Block that door. He's looking for the turrets. After him, Benny. He's heading for the light. Don't let him jump to that next landing. Look out, you crazy fool. That ledge is too narrow. That's what you think, I... Oh, oh, oh. Boy, that's a long way down. Did you get him, Doc? No, Ham. He won't be able to tell us anything. Neither will Thackeray Hutchinson. He's dead. Wow. Yeah, that makes it tougher. How so, Mom? Well, we haven't seen all the guys in this fountain of youth gang, Pat. Some of them might be around waiting for this Kel Avery's plane. Looks more like autograph grabbers and photographers. Well, that would mean a celebrity's arriving, wouldn't it? Yeah, but them fountain of youth guys could be in disguise. Pat. Yes, Doc? Can you change your appearance in a hurry? Well, if I had some dark glasses, I could. There are some in the car. Get them, Long Tom. Right. Ham, lend me that snappy top coat of yours. Huh? You're about Pat's size. Come on, shed it. I don't get it, Doc. I don't think that Fountain of Youth crew got a good look at Pat this afternoon. If we alter her appearance slightly with the coat and the glasses, they might not recognize her. The idea being that nobody's to think I'm with you. Exactly. 
Here are the glasses, Doc. Thanks, Long Tom. Now, Pat, keep your eyes open and be ready to grab any loose ends that we let slip. Right. Here comes the plane, Doc. Good. Let's see if we can find out why so many people are here. Say, Doc, I just talked to a reporter. Maureen Darling is coming in on that plane. Maureen Darling? A picture actress? Uh, None other. If I remember my gossip sheets, Maureen Darling is no big shot. Just played opposite a couple of well-known actors. I wonder why all the fuss. Oh, haven't you heard, Ham? Maureen Darling was kidnapped in Florida yesterday, but she escaped. The papers yesterday were full of it. Sounds suspiciously like a publicity stunt. Perhaps, Ham, but that would explain why all the photographers and the autograph hounds are here. (laughs) But some of those guys may belong to the Fountain of Youth Gang. Yes, Long Tom, they might. Hey, well, the plane's in, and a crowd's moving toward the door. I've lost sight of Pat. I wonder where... Here's delivery! What's that? Delivery over there! Help! Help! There's a fight! Come on! Are you hurt, Avery? My name's not Avery. I'm Joe Smith. I'm a reporter on the morning comet. This thud's all of a sudden jumped at me, yelling something about me being Cal Avery. All right, you mugs. What's this all about? Some guy hired us to jump this bird, Kel Avery, when the plane came in and beat him up. We got 50 bucks apiece. How did you know who Kel Avery was? The guy pointed him out to us. What did this man look like? Uh, short, uh, pudgy, with a long, skinny mustache. Santee! We fell for a trick to divert our attention. But why divert our attention? Duh! Duh! Some people just told me that during the fight over here, another gang grabbed Maureen Darling and another woman and carried him off in a car. How did this happen, Rennie? Uh, they slugged a bodyguard this Maureen Darling had along. What beautiful dopes we turned out to be. This fight was to get our attention while the gang grabbed Maureen Darling. But I thought they were after Kel Avery. Where is this bodyguard of Maureen Darling's, Rennie? Over there. There he is, Doc. Oh, he is some bodyguard. Built almost as well as you, Doc. Are you Kel Avery? Mister, my name no Kel Avery. My name DeClima. You are Marine Darling's bodyguard. Well, maybe was her guard. Maybe it is she won't want guard who is guard not so hot. No. Oh, I don't get it. We're here to keep Santini's gang from grabbing Kel Avery. Instead, we get tricked away to a fight that's supposed to be Kel Avery. And meanwhile, Santini grabs somebody who ain't Kel Avery. But that is it. Men do take Kel Avery. What are you saying? Yeah, that is what I try to tell you. Maureen, darling, is Kel Avery. What does the Fountain of Youth gang want with Kel Avery? What is the mysterious secret that meant the death of banker Thackeray Hutchinson? And who is Dan Thunden, who claims to be 131 years old? Don't miss The Disappointing Parcel, Chapter 3 of Fear Key, next time on The Adventures of Doc Savage. Fear Key was written by Lester Dent and adapted for radio by Roger Rittner. Featured in the cast were Daniel Chodos, Robert Towers, Art Dutch, Kimmet Muston, Bill Ratner, Scott McKenna, Glenn Shaddix, and Robin Riker. Also heard were Michael McConaughey, Bob Farley, William Irwin, and Bob Lyons. Sound effects were created by David Surtees, assisted by Jerry Williams. Production assistance by Samantha Kimmel and Doris Christie. Engineering by Denny King. of Doc Savage is produced and directed by Roger Rittner and is a presentation of the Variety Arts Radio Theater.
Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.